Hello. So I'm going to tell you the story of the Kroglin vampire. This is said to be the best documented, allegedly true story of a vampire in England. Of course, since that claim was made, there have been other vampire stories, such as the Keithley vampire and the Highgate vampire from the 1970s. But this does have a lot of detail to the story, so it is quite persuasive. The story first appears in a book by a man called Augustus Hare uh, from 1890. Uh, the story is a biography called My Life, and it contains some sketches and pieces of folklore, and this is one of those pieces of folklore. So first of all, I need to tell you where Kroglin is and describe the scene a little bit. So Kroglin is a small hamlet, really, that lies on what we call the eastern fell side. It's on the edge of the river Eden's Valley, where the land starts to slope up towards the Pennines, which is a range of hills that forms the backbone of England. Now, this part of the Pennines is the North Pennines, not far from the Scottish border, and it's pretty wild these days. It's covered in heather and round, trackless, boggy hills, which is a haven for wildlife because it is so remote. There are a string of villages along the eastern fell side, and Croglin is one of them. And as I say, it's pretty remote today. The story doesn't take place in the village. It takes place at a, at a place called Kroglin Low Hall. So if you go out of the village towards the west and you come to a crossroads and take the left, the first house you'll see, an old house, probably dating in its current form from the late 1600s, uh, is Kroglin High Hall, but that's not the one we're after. You need to go on a little bit further until you come to, on the other side of the road, about half a mile further on, Kroglin Low Hall. So Kroglin Low Hall is again an old building, probably from the late 1600s. It's been uh, built up over the years. Now, it was originally the property of the Howard family. The Howard family in the Middle Ages were a very powerful local landowners. In fact, across all England, they were the Dukes of Norfolk, which of course is a fair way away from Cumberland. But they were also the Earls of Carlisle and owned a lot of castles such as Greystoke and Naworth nearby. And they were one of the, the main families that stood on what was called the English West March against uh, raiding Scots that would come over the border. This story dates from just before the Act of Union of England and Scotland but, um, and after the English Civil War. So, we, so if you think it's remote now, the area, think how remote it would have been then. So I think the English Civil War ended in 1651. And although it ended for a victory for the parliamentary forces, who tended to be quite strongly Protestant and Puritan, um, the Catholic forces and the non-Puritans, particularly the Catholics and the supporters of a Catholic king, uh, were in hiding. And they remained, and the Howards remained uh, Catholic. But by this time, the Howards had sold Kroglin Low Hall to a man called Augustus Fisher. Uh, but he didn't live there. It was one of his properties that he let out. So towards the end of the English Civil War, in the early 1650s, a family appeared. And there were two brothers, uh, John, Joseph, and a sister called Dorothy. And their family name was Cranswell. And they had come quite a long way from Suffolk. Suffolk, it would take you several hours to drive, a number of hours to drive these days, but in those days it was going to take days to get there. These were the days of this, the early stage coaches, so-called so because they went in stages and they stopped at coaching inns where people could get um, a night's sleep, potentially, or certainly um, food and drink. But just for comparison, in the early 1700s it took eight days to get from London to Exeter, which is probably about the same distance, although that was a very important route, whereas the route from um, Suffolk, say Ipswich, to to, um, Kroglin is far more difficult and lesser travelled. So I guess they would have travelled from Ipswich potentially up the old Roman road to York and from York up the again the old Roman road to the old city, the border city of Carlisle, but probably before they got to Carlisle they would have stopped off and taken horses from somewhere like Penrith. In any event the Cranswells took up their lodging at Kroglin Low Hall in say around 1652, we don't know the exact date. And we don't know why they went there, because they weren't farmers, they were gentlefolk. And there is a suspicion that they were Catholics in refuge, and so they were, if you like, enemies of the state, and they were looking for somewhere to lie low. Um, not that they were planning any gunpowder plots or anything like that. It was merely because um, potentially their family in Suffolk had run foul of the authorities and they were looking for somewhere to go. So. The two brothers and the sister arrive at Kroglin Low Hall, which is a remote place, as we've said, in the summer. And everything is fine. 
the local people were um, yeoman farmers. That area was known for a lack of nobility, and most of the people were owned their own farms and made their living from the lands, probably going back to the Viking days, um, you know, 600 years before they had lived, and they liked to be left alone and get on with their business. But they were a close-knit community, tended to be related to each other, and uh, the Cranswells were a novelty in the area. They didn't mix much with the locals, um, but potentially they may have gone to the tavern in Crogland itself, into the inn in Crogland. I'm not sure it was an inn, I'm not sure it had um, bedrooms but, uh, for travellers, but potentially it was just a drinking place. And the local ale would have been brewed by the owner of the tavern. Anyway, I digress. So the Cranswells kept themselves to themselves. They were gentle folk, they had some money, they didn't farm the land, but they took walks, potentially they wrote, uh, Dorothy embroidered, and anyway, they seemed to settle down to the very rural, lonely life in Croglin by the eastern fell side. So the summer was pleasant, and then the autumn came, and then the winter came with the snows, and it, then they learned how remote Croglin was. The snows coming down from the Pennines, the place would be cut off for days, so you had to be self-sufficient, you had to have food in, you had to have firewood in, and, uh, but the loneliness didn't seem to bother them. And then the spring would come round first with the snowdrops and then the crocuses and the first leaves on the trees, and they still continued to enjoy their life there. And the spring, with its uh, going into the bluebells, you can follow the progress of the year with the flowers in the celandine, eventually getting into the summer flowers and then the heat of the summer. It can be, we can have cold summers up here, but this particular summer, like the summer of 2022, was a hot one. And uh, they enjoyed themselves. And then one night, I think it was in August, let's say it was in August, it was a hot night anyway, they were sitting together with the windows open, watching a big old yellow moon rise, you know, the full moon. And Dorothy seemed to find herself tired than her brothers, so she decided she would retire to bed. And it was a practice, perhaps from days living in uh, more uh, urban surroundings, to lock her bedroom door. But it was so warm that she kept the window open and she went to bed. But it was hard to sleep because it was stifling and warm. And outside, the big baleful ivory moon cast its rays, bathing everything in that yellow and white light. She dozed, but she couldn't get into a deep sleep because it was so warm and she was lying on the bed with the covers off. So she decided at some point in the middle of the night, say 1, 2 a.m., to go to the window and look out to get some fresh air. Of course, there were no electric lights of the night. It would have been black, completely black, apart from the moon. Now, the moon by this time was waning, but it was still giving some light. It was getting low on the horizon. And then, idly looking around and listening to the sounds of the night, the foxes barking, the tawny owls hooting from the trees, she thought she saw a pair of eyes red eyes. Now, that was quite unusual, and she tried to make sense of it. What would a pair of eyes be doing there? And she thought, well, maybe it's a fox. But it was too high, the eyes were too high off the ground for a fox. The same went for rabbits or badgers. And of course, there hadn't been bears in that part of England for a couple of hundred years. There was still the odd wolf pack in the Pennines, but they wouldn't come down in the summer because the food was plentiful in the lands they preferred up out of the way of men. But she looked at those red eyes, and she thought, well, is it a glint of some reflected light? But it wasn't, and the eyes were moving. Now, there's something I've forgotten to tell you about Crogland Low Hall, from the days its medieval past when it was owned by the Howards. The Howards had built a chapel, and that wasn't so unusual. They were a religious family, uh, and they buried some of the local members of the family, and possibly the retainers of the family, in that chapel in a crypt underneath. Now, by the 1650s, it was ruinous. Now, you can't see it at all, it's completely disappeared beneath uh, the grass and the trees, and there's just heaps of rubble in the ground. But then, there were walls standing, and it seemed to Dorothy that these red eyes were coming from the direction of the chapel where it stood in the trees. And furthermore, the red eyes were coming her way. Well, she told herself not to be so silly. What could it be that was threatening her? But there was something about those red eyes that gave her the chills. And so, with her hand to her throat, she closed the windows. In those days, the windows did have glass in them, but they couldn't make the really big panes of glass. And so what they did was make little diamonds and then fix them in place with leading. So you, I'm sure you've seen this kind of actually authentic window from those days or a reproduction whereby the glass panes are in lead diamonds. And you can tell the glass is old because it tends to be bubbly and misshapen, whereas modern glass isn't. But it lets the light through and that's the job. 
Um, it lets some of the moonlight through, but as she drew the windows closed, she put the latch on them. Because there was something about those red eyes that disturbed her. I mean, she told herself it must be an animal of some kind, and just it was a trick of the light to see them so high off the ground, probably at the height of a man's eyes. But that couldn't be, because who would be wandering around at this time of night? But even so, she retired to bed and lay there and listened. And she heard the sound of somebody scuffing the gravel outside, just very lightly, like they were trying not to make a sound. And she lay there, becoming increasingly frightened. And then she heard a weird noise, a pick, 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 pick noise. And scrabble, 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 pick, scrabble, pick noise. And she looked and she wondered what on earth was going on. She could hardly see because the room was dark now that the windows were closed. All there was was just pale light, pale yellow light coming in through the panes, the diamond panes of glass. And then she saw what the cause of the noise was. And what the cause of the noise was, was somebody picking at the lead of one of the diamonds of glass, picking with the fingers. Now she was really alarmed this time and she sat up in bed and she was thinking of getting out the door. But it would mean going closer to the window to get to the door, and also the door was locked. She locked the door. And she watched in some terrified fascination as these long, bony fingers picked at the lead and freed the diamond of glass which fell onto the gravel outside, pulled out by the bony fingers. And then once one diamond of glass was out, it was easy to get rid of the second until there was a hole big enough for a bony hand to enter in. And this bony hand entered through the hole it had made and felt about like a big, dry spider. And she realized what it was looking for. It was looking for the latch. So the hand reached in and she was petrified with fear, frozen with terror, so she couldn't move. A hand to her throat shaking as the hand reached in and quickly grabbed the latch, pulled the latch and pulled the window open. And then there was a shuffling and a thing came in through the window, some shape scrabbling, some man-sized shape, pulling itself into the room, pulling itself into the room and scuttling across the floor. And this time she screamed and she ran to the door, pushing past this shape, but the shape was very strong and fastened onto her. She got to the door, but the door was locked. The key was in the lock, but she was so frightened. She couldn't turn the key and she screamed and screamed, but the thing, the bony, thin thing, the bony, thin, dry, skeletal thing of bones and dry flesh grabbed onto her, pulled at her and fastened on her neck and bit with sharp, foul, yellow teeth until a rivulet of blood ran down. And Dorothy screamed and screamed and screamed and her brothers woke and came, ran, hammering. Dorothy, what's the matter? What's the matter? But she couldn't speak because this thing was holding onto her, licking like some kind of bat at her throat. And she screamed and she turned the key and now the brothers are hammering on the door and suddenly they push in and seeing the brothers the thing breaks free and just as fast as it had come in like some kind of vile huge insect thing it scrabbled its way out of the room through the window it had come in and scuttled away at great speed well they ran to the window the brothers ran john and joseph ran to the window to see but of course although there was some moonlight it was hard to make out it appeared to be going back towards the trees where the chapel was but they lost it. Dorothy, as you can imagine, was in a terrible state. Terrible state. Sobbing, shrieking her hand to her throat, her fingers staunching the blood. I mean, she hadn't actually lost much blood, but the shock of it was terrifying. They stayed up with her all night, staying guard, but the thing didn't return. And then in the morning, she was in such a state that John, the eldest of the brothers, said they had to leave. They couldn't stay here. How could they stay here when their sister had been attacked? And they tried to make sense of what was going on. This was in the days before the asylum, and what used to happen to people who were sadly insane would be that they would wander the countryside, begging and finding what animals they could to eat, eating carrion, whatever. But, uh, and they put it down to that, that it was a, an escaped lunatic, escaped from the towns and gone wandering in the summer, and had suddenly decided to break into their house. But whatever the cause of it, it was too traumatic for Dorothy to stay. So they decided to go to France. They had either friends, probably friends rather than relatives, or fellow followers of whatever particular Jacobite or Catholic rebellion they supported. 
and they made their way to France and they stayed there. And they stayed there the rest of that summer and through the winter. And the way that their um, lease was organised with uh, Mr Fisher was that they were still paying it. So the brothers were quite prepared to stay in France and forget about Croglin, but Dorothy had settled down a little bit and her fear seemed a long way and, and wherever she was in France, in Paris or in Normandy, it was a long way from the wilds of Croglin Low Hall. And so her courage returned and she realised that it was a terrible waste of money for them to uh, pay the rent from where they were staying in France and also to be leasing out Croglin Low Hall, a place which they couldn't get out of the contract. And so she persuaded the brothers to return. They were in two minds. They didn't want to go somewhere where she was going to be terrified. And so, uh, but it was her that persuaded them. And so they made their way back to England on the boat to Dover, and then from Dover to London, London to York, York to Carlisle, and from the horses down from Carlisle to Croglin Low Hall. And they saw it again, boarded up as it was, and they opened Croglin Low Hall up. And this was early summer. The weather was very benign. The, le the trees were in full leaf, the flowers were out in the meadows, and it seemed a veritable paradise. So they struggled to think what they had been frightened of. But Dorothy didn't lock her door anymore, and the brothers took to carrying pistols, loaded pistols, with balls and gunpowder at their hips, just in case. And she said to them it would be terrible bad luck to be attacked by another wandering lunatic. And lightning never strikes the same place twice, as we all know. So they settled back into life, and some weeks and even months went by, and everything seemed just as it had been in the good times before she was attacked. And she kept her candle burning late into the night just to give her light. And then one night, when she was deep asleep, she was woken by a terribly familiar sound, the sound of scrabbling and scratching and picking, picking at the lead scrabbling at the window as if something was seeking a way in and she lay there wondering if she was still asleep and she was in a nightmare reliving the experience but the candle fluttered and she knew she wasn't dreaming that this was real and impossible as it might be to believe the same thing was happening again the pick 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 scrabble pick and then a diamond of glass falls in on the tiled floor and smashes and then another and then quick as the vile insect it resembled it pushed the window open and this thing this dry thin thing the thing of bones and flesh and decayed yellow teeth and blazing red eyes pulled itself into the room with her and Dorothy screamed, and this time her brothers were ready. They attended very quickly. They ran, their footsteps echoing on the tiled floor outside, and they shoved the door open, and the thing looked at them and ran. But they were quick this time, and John and Joseph followed where it had gone to the window, and they leaned out, and they saw this shape running across the dark towards the trees, towards where the chapel and its crypt was. And John had his pistol, and he fired. He heard the thud. He saw the puff of the smoke, the flash of the powder, and he thought he'd hit it. And he shouted, Joseph, Joseph, I've hit it, go out the door. So Joseph ran out the door in the dark. John climbed out of the window, went after him, and they followed to where this thing had gone into the stand of trees, into the rubble, into the walls that stood still of the chapel in its crypt. But they lost it. Now, you might think that they knew where it had gone, and you might be right. But on a dark night, with a thing that looks like nothing you've ever seen before, a dry, stick-like man-thing with wizened flesh and thin bones going to a crypt in the dark of the night. Would you be brave enough to follow it? Whatever it was, they weren't. And even in the daylight, they wavered about going into the crypt. John and Joseph stood there. There was an iron gate on the crypt. It wasn't locked, so they could get into it quite easily, but something held them back. And me, for one, I don't blame them. So instead, they went to Croglin to find more news of what happened. And they made their way to the tavern in the hamlet of Croglin itself. And in there they found various of the local men, notably George Bruff and William Tallentire, who were local yeomen. And they took a particular interest in that, because William Tallentire farmed at Croglin High Hall, and Joseph Bruff was just a little bit further down the valley. And they said that strange things had been happening in their farms all this past year or two and the daughter of one of them had been bitten on the neck 
and they put it down to rats getting in. But of course, then the rumours came that it wasn't rats. And Joseph and John told the story about how the thing had run in what appeared to be the direction of the crypt, and what they suspected it had done, had gone and found some refuge in the crypt. Well, the men didn't like to think about what might be there, so they told themselves the old story about an escaped lunatic finding refuge in the crypt. That is to say, a mortal man. But the villagers whispered that this was no mortal man, and that something had been seen on the byways and lanes around Crogley, visiting the different distant farms, that it was no mortal man, but it was something quite other, something supernatural. And so the men decided to go. By the time they worked up their courage, it was getting on at past eight in the evening, and the sun would set pretty soon, in about half an hour. So they suggested they wait till the next day, but the blood was up, and everybody was clamouring to go there and then and sort this thing out and find what it was in the crypt, and, of course, to punish it. So John and Joseph led the way with William Tallentire and George Brough from the local farms and of course the sons and the uncles and the grandfathers all came along and behind them came all the village women including Dorothy who had met some of them before but didn't know them very well and they were much fascinated by her funny accent and the clothes she wore as much as the story she told but of course the story itself was quite outrageous and would be enough to pique their interests. So the whole raggletag band made its way down the, the remote country road to Crogland Low Hall and there they found the tumble-down chapel with the steps leading down to the crypt, surrounded by the trees. By the time they got to the crypt, amongst its trees, the sun was very low on the horizon, and they knew it would be dark before long. But something, probably a natural lack of courage about the unknown, had held them back. And so they spent a lot of time debating about what they were going to do, until at last William Tallentire said, we need to go down. We need to go down now before it gets dark. And George Brough agreed with him. Now, John and Joseph Cranswell were the people who should go down because, after all, it had attacked their sister and John was the eldest. But still, they held back. And there were silences and nervousness grew in the crowd. The women at the back chattering. The men trying to pretend they were brave but finding their courage surprisingly lacking. In the end, John said, I'll go down, I'll go down. So it was so late by this time he had to take a burning torch because there would not be enough light in the crypt. So he went down the stone steps and he pulled at the iron gate which creaked open. And then he noticed the marks on the stone in the mossy stone that showed that the crypt gate had been opened not too long before. And he went into the crypt. Now the crypt was fashioned, as he could see with his burning torch, with stone shelves and on the stone shelves were decayed coffins. They belonged to the Howards and the Fishes, and the servants of the Howards and the Fishes. It wasn't a big crypt, maybe 10 or 12 spaces altogether. Some decayed flowers still there from more a century or more before, just the dried rot of the flowers, and the smell of decay, the smell of wood, the stink of flesh as well, of old decayed flesh and metallic tang of old blood. One of these coffins stood out because it wasn't an old, old coffin. In fact, it looked like a coffin for the past 20 years or so. It wasn't decayed and rotten and falling in like the others where you could see the bones and the skulls grinning out from the holes in the old decayed coffins. No, this one was in far better condition. And with the brand in one hand, John Cranswell worked up his courage and he lifted the coffin lid. And the coffin lid wasn't nailed down as perhaps some of the others would have been. And in there, he found a shriveled, bony thing with eyes wide open and unseeing, with teeth yellow and elongated, with shrunken gums, its flesh dried and the sinew showing and the fingernails long and brown and stained with blood. And this thing was naked and every bone showed, but it wasn't decayed like it should have been. It looked like it had been dried. And then he saw in the leg was a hole the hole that hadn't bled, but in the hole he could see what appeared to be a pistol ball. And so it seemed to him that he'd found the culprit. And it also seemed to him that this was no escaped lunatic. This was no poor soul who'd come down here looking for whatever shelter he could find. This was something quite different. This was something that survived on blood. And who knows, it may have sucked the blood of chickens and rats, but it clearly preferred the blood of people. And it was this 
that had twice broken into their house. And it was this most likely that had been seen lurking in the dark, on the lanes and lonely farmhouses around Croglin. And it was this that had come into his sister Dorothy's bedroom and tried to bite her and drink her blood. Well, John Cranswell was shocked, as you would imagine. The thing was not stirring, the thing appeared dead, but he knew enough of the superstition to believe that when the sun finally set and night came, that this thing would stir. And they knew that though it had run from them, it was immensely strong. And he suspected that it couldn't be killed with a pistol ball, but other more potent ways would need to be found to get rid of this vampire. And so he went up and joined his brother. And there was William Tallentire and John Bruff and the other local men. And he told them what he'd seen. And he invited them to go down and check if they didn't believe him. But none were brave enough to do that. And in the end, they decided that what they would do would be set fire to the chapel, set fire to the crypt. And so John Cranswell and his brother Joseph went down with burning brands and they lit the coffin and the dry thing inside. And it went up like tinder and soon the crypt was full of dancing flames and smoke and the most appalling smell as the fire consumed this grinning thing with its long teeth. And then, just as the sun was going down outside, the creature's eyes flicked open and began to stir. And the two men ran out of the crypt, pushed the iron gate closed and jumped up the steps where the rest of them, getting courage from their numbers. And they watched, but soon the fire caught and whatever wood and whatever fuel was in that place, they had to back off as the crypt burned and was consumed in the conflagration. And that is more or less the end of the story. Except the Cranswells left. They had no stomach to stay there. And we don't know where they went and they disappear from the story and they're not important. But about a year later in the tavern in Croglin, William Tallentire and George Bruff were sitting around the table supping their brown ale. And George Bruff said, there's been rumours again of children being attacked in the night and marks being found at their throat. And people have put it down to rats or even foxes creeping into the farmhouses. But a strange dark shape has been seen in the lanes and lurking in the shadows around the houses, around Crockling. And William Tallentire said, I've heard those rumours, George. Yeah, I've heard those rumours. And George says, but w what can it be? It can't be that thing in the crypt at Crogling Low Hall. I mean, we burned it. We burned it. I saw with my own eyes the flames. I went back and saw the ashes. There was nothing that remained of it. And William Tallentire took a sip of his ale, of his tankard. He says, aye, we burned it. We burned the thing at Crogling Low Hall. Sure enough, that's true. And George Bruff said, well, how do you explain it then? These, these attacks, these things that are seen at night. And William Tallentire looked at him and he said, Ah, well, George, what if there was more than one of them? Everybody dies, don't they? 
Everybody so. come back. Then. Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How do the dead come, come back, Mother? What's the secret? This is a true story. It happened in 1777, just south of Carlisle. And you must remember that in 1777 it was only two years since the city had been taken by Bonnie Prince Charlie and his Highland rebels. At that time the city had given way very quickly and Charlie had been crowned King of Great Britain in Carlisle. But after his defeat, the castle was full of Highland prisoners and the city was heavily garrisoned with the soldiers of King George. So there had been much unrest in those days, and the rule of law was not what it had been. Inside the city walls it was safe if you were an upstanding member of the merchant class or aristocracy. But outside the city the story was quite different. The road that goes south from Carlisle is known as the Great High Road, and it goes south through Penrith, eventually down through Lancaster, and ultimately to London. In 1777, the Great High Road was haunted by highwaymen. And it was very dangerous to go out on that road after dark, and it was said only the bravest or the most foolhardy would venture on the Great High Road once night had fallen. The most notorious highwayman in those days was a man called John Whitefield, and he hailed from Coat Hill, a small village just off the Great High Road, and he made a fine living from robbing the people who went up and down on their daily trade. But he was a wily man and had not been caught, even though the authorities suspected very much who he was. Well, in September 1777, one night, a man called Isaac Dodd who was only 33, but had done very well for himself. His father had had a little money, but now he had made good of the money and then invested in shipping in Whitehaven and in the lead mines on Alston Moor. He had a linen manufactory on the River Eden at Armathwaite, where his house was. But this particular day, he'd been for a meeting with business associates in a grand house on Fisher Street, now you remember that Fisher Street is where the Earl of Lonsdale had his grand mansion and many other fine houses. So the people he was dealing with had done very well for themselves and after the meeting they fed him with meat and then pastries and good red claret wine. But as the evening drew on and the afternoon faded they wanted him to stay but he was keen to return home to Armathwaite some five or six miles south of Carlisle, along the Great High Road. He wanted to see his wife, Hannah, and his two children. His hosts bade him stay for the night. They had plenty of bedrooms, they said, and he could set off just as early as he wanted the next day and be home within an hour or so and see his wife and children then. But Isaac Dodd would hear nothing of it. For although he was a successful merchant, he was also a well-beloved family man and he wanted to see Hannah and his children, hopefully to put them to bed for the night. So despite their protestations, he left their grand house in Fisher Street and mounted his bay horse and set off just as the evening was coming on and the daylight was fading and a light drizzle set in. He went through Carlisle, through the South Gates, onto Botchergate, and then along what is the London Road, the Great High Road, until he left the city. The night had fallen now, and the clouded sky and the rain made it darker than it would have been otherwise. But he was full of wine, and he'd done a good business deal, so he was dozing a little, and his bay horse knew the way home, so she clip-clopped all the way along the Great High Road, out of Carlisle, through Carlton, and then came to the Golden Fleece Inn, but he didn't stop there, he continued on the Great High Road until he came to the turn for Coat Hill. He wasn't paying much attention to his surroundings. He was dozing, daydreaming, in reverie, as he went along in the dark night. But as he passed the Coat Hill turn, he thought he felt 
the sense of somebody behind him. So he slowed the horse and turned in his saddle and looked behind him, but the visibility was poor and he couldn't see anybody. So he continued on and his horse clip-clopped along and he thought that he'd just been prey to imaginations because this was where the great highwayman John Whitefield lurked. But he didn't know anybody who'd been accosted by Whitefield and perhaps he half imagined that Whitefield's story was just um, just that, a story to scare children and the weak-minded. But as he went on, he became more aware of the sound of another horse behind him matching his pace, perhaps waiting for a dark turn in the road where robbery would be easier and less likely to be observed. But there were no other travellers on the road. The evening was dark, the weather was bad, and as it said, only the bravest or the most foolhardy would travel the great high road after dark in those years. He speeded his horse up, now more alert, and as he speeded, and as the horse's pace picked up, he heard the sound of the other's horse quickening after him, and he felt fear rise to his throat. And then they came to a turn just under the shadow of Barrack Fell, where the trees clustered on the sides of that pointed, peaked hill, and visibility was poorer still. No one would see whatever happened here, and this must have been his pursuer's plan, for with a rush he heard the horse galloping. He tried to make his own horse gallop, but the pursuer was faster still and cut him off, and a dark cloaked figure wearing a blue coat and a mask and a tricorn hat came in front of him, pulled out two pistols and said, Stand and deliver your money or your life. At first Isaac Dodd didn't know what to say, so taken aback was he, and the man continued, Aye, I'll take whatever you have in your pockets, your guineas and your gold watch and your pocketbook. Now hand it over to me now. And Isaac Dodd said, And why should I give you my guineas and my gold watch and my pocketbook? What have you done to deserve this? Who are you? And the man said, I am one whose reputation you should know. I am one for whose sake you should have avoided this dark and lonely road on this dreary, miserable night. And I am one who shall shoot you dead if you do not comply with my polite reasonable request. Now Isaac Dodd was no coward, and he said, I'll give it to you that you're polite enough, but I don't find your request reasonable to take all my hard-earned belongings, things I've worked long and hard for. And the other man said, well I think my offer of an exchange of your life in return for your valuables is very reasonable indeed. And so they continued with this banter until John Whitefield trained his pistols and said, Enough of this. Give me your goods, or I'll shoot you dead. At this point, Isaac Dodd, who was not unarmed, first produced his rapier, then produced his pistol, and said, Have at ye, ye scoundrel. And with his knees, he urged his bay horse towards the highwayman. The highwayman fired with both pistols, first one and then the other. The first one missed, but the second one struck Isaac Dodd in his chest. Not knowing how sorely he was wounded and full of rage and temper at being so accosted on the king's highway, Isaac Dodd continued his charge. Now John Whitefield had discharged both his pistols. He had a dagger, but no other weapon. As they closed, John Whitefield stabbed Isaac Dodd with his dagger right in his stomach. Isaac Dodd let drop his rapier and let drop his pistol, and with nothing else, grabbed at the blue coat of the highwayman John Whitefield. But Isaac Dodd had received his death blow, and he could fight no longer, 
and the highwayman pushed him away, but Isaac Dodd grabbed at one of the pretty silver buttons that lined the vain highwayman's blue coat, and he pulled the button off, but he was very badly injured. John Whitefield then, at knife point, robbed Isaac Dodd of his gold watch and his guineas and his pocketbook. And then he said, I'll not have you die here on the great high road. So go on your way and may your horse take you home. And with that, John Whitefield left with his ill-gotten gains. The bay horse knew the way back to Armathwaite very well and it took its stricken master on its back. And then, when they were in sight of Isaac Dodd's house, the servant, who had been watching out for him because Isaac Dodd was late, saw the horse and saw his slumped master's form on the back of the horse. And he came up to the horse and he grabbed the reins and he took them into the house. Isaac Dodd's wife, Hannah, was beside herself. She ordered one of the maids to take the two children and take them in the house and lock the door so they couldn't see the fate of their father. Then she went to Isaac Dodd as he was laid out on the kitchen table, blood running from him, and it was obvious that he had met his end. Hannah, with her hand to her mouth, said, Husband, husband, who has done this to you? And it was almost for a minute as if Isaac Dodd was going to speak but instead he took his death rattle and he passed away. And as he passed away, his fist opened and a silver button fell from his hand and clattered on the stone floor of the kitchen. As I said, John Whitefield's crimes were well known, but so far they had nothing to prove against him. But now this button seemed to be the clue that would lead them to him and the authorities took it and went to John Whitefield's house, and sure enough they found his blue coat with its fancy silver buttons, and one of those buttons missing, and the button that was missing matched exactly the silver button that had fallen from the dead hand of Isaac Dodd. An emergency assizes was held at Carlisle Castle, and a judge was called, and soon found John Whitefield guilty of the murder of Isaac Dodd. John Whitefield, to his credit, admitted that he had killed Isaac Dodd. But he said, if he'd only let me rob him and not pulled out his pistol and his rapier, he would be alive today. Such foolishness that men trade baubles and gee-jaws like guineas and pocketbooks and gold watches for their lives and their family. He could be living to a grand old age with his children around him and his grey-haired wife beside him. And now he lies in the grave just because he wouldn't part with a few scraps of money. But the judge was not persuaded to offer leniency, even on this account. And he ordered that John Whitefield be gibbeted alive in an iron cage that was hung by the great high road under the shadow of the tall pointed hill known as Barrack Fell. But the story doesn't end here, because it took John Whitefield two weeks to die, and he screamed and he whimpered as every passenger and every traveller went past on the great high road and saw his emaciated naked form imprisoned in the iron gibbet that swung in the wind, and how he screamed louder as the crows and the ravens alighted on the gibbet and took what flesh they could reach through the iron cage. Now, in those days, there was a daily mail coach that went from Carlisle to Penrith on the Great High Road. It went in the morning and came back in the afternoon. The driver tended to be the same man, and twice a day, once in the morning and once in the afternoon, he had to endure the screamings of John Whitefield as the coach went under the shadow of Barrack Fell. And after two weeks, moved by pity, he took the musket he held beside him for defence against highwaymen and shot John Whitfield dead. But it doesn't end there, because since that time, on dark, windy nights, 
under the shadow of Barrack Fell, where the great high road still goes, although it's less used these days. Travellers have reported hearing screaming in the wind from where the gibbet used to hang. And it might be that if you find yourself on the great high road, under the shadow of Barrack Fell, you'll hear the squeaking of the chains of the gibbet as it moves in the wind, even though it's been long removed. And you might hear the wailings and the screams of John Whitefield. And if you're very unlucky, you might even see the spectral form of John Whitefield that is reported to haunt the crossroads under the shadow of Barrack Fell where the road turns for Coat Hill. And if you see him, he may well point his ghostly pistols at you and issue you the command, stand and deliver your money or your life. And then you might need to think which is the most important, your money or your life, and not make the mistake that young Isaac Dodds made on that night in September 1777. This is a ghost story, it's a true story. It was told to me first when I was a little boy and I heard it from my grandfather. My grandfather was a man called William Fell and he was a coal miner. And in those days, there were a lot of coal mines in West Cumbria or Cumberland as it used to be, but now they're all closed and all the traces of them are gone really. All the slag heaps are grown over. All the winding heads of the great towers that sent the lifts down are all gone. So this dates from the late 1950s, early 60s, and when he was working at a place called Siddick. You may know that miners, coal miners, probably all miners, are very superstitious people. And I suppose that is to do with the fact that there are so many ways that you can die down a coal mine. You can be suffocated as the air is taken from you by the gas known as choke damp. Or there's a combustible gas known as fire damp, which can kill you by fire. And these coal mines, they run many miles out, up to three miles out under the sea. And the miners dug down there to follow the seams of coal, which are very faulted because the, the geology is quite difficult there. So they would follow them. So the third way would be when the sea broke in and there were numerous disasters where the sea came in and drowned the miners who were working there. And there are monuments to them in Whitehaven and Lauka and places like that. So air, fire, water, and of course, earth because they could simply collapse on you and crush you to death. Or worse still, they could stop your exit with tons and tons of rock, so that even if you survived, there was no way you were ever going to get out. So I guess this all contributed towards coal miners, and all miners, as I said, being very superstitious men. For example, I remember there was the superstition that in the tin bath that they had in front of the fire, the small of the back must remain unwashed, because there was a superstition that if you wash the small of the back, then they won't be able to support the strength of the rock if it caves in on them. I don't know if that actually makes a lot of sense, but that was the superstition. Now, in this particular mine at Siddick, there was a place deep down called the Ladies' Gallery. One of the miners who used to work at my granddad, William Fell, was John Bragg. Now, John Bragg was particularly superstitious, and he had a, a sweetheart that he'd been engaged to be married to called Dorothy, but she died of tuberculosis. 
But he, for some reason, always kept a piece of blue silk with him that had been hers, although they never actually got married. And he never looked at any other woman because he was so in love with his memory of his Dorothy. Well, you could consider that a superstition. But where it becomes a bit weird is that in this gallery known as the Ladies' Gallery, there was supposed to be a ghost. And it, it, it was kind of shunned by people. It wasn't on the main thoroughfare. So what used to happen was it would go down from in, the, in the iron cages down, I don't know how far down, but hundreds of feet down under the earth. And they would, then they would have to walk up to three miles to get to the coalface, by which time this was un, by the, under the sea, three miles under the sea. So the ladies' gallery was sidelined. It wasn't on the main thoroughfare down. It was a place for storage. And because it was quite quiet, not many people went there. And for some reason, it got the reputation of being haunted by the ghost of a lady, hence the name. So what was supposed to happen was that you would hear the rustling of silk, as in a lady's dress. And obviously there were no, dre no ladies in silk dresses down the coal mine. So this was held to be the ghost that haunted the ladies' gallery. So people kept away from it because, as I said, they were superstitious men. Now, the, the legend of the ghost would come and go, as these things do. And over time, nothing much would happen. And then there would be an upsurge in sightings, or rather, hearings of the rustle of silk. So this happened one particular time. And John Bragg became really interested. And in his head, somehow, he connected this rustling of silk with the scrap of blue silk that he had from his Dorothy's dress, his fiancée, who he never married, because she was sadly taken from him. So he became obsessed with this, and he always wanted to go to the ladies' gallery. Anyway, the, how I heard the story was my granddad said to me that um, uh, John Bragg had been pestering him, wanting to go to the ladies' gallery. Uh, but of course, there was no real reason, other than, I can't remember what they kept there, but there would be the odd reason to go and pick up some machinery, but mostly there was no reason to go there. So John Bragg always wanted to go there, but he obviously wasn't brave enough to go on his own because he wanted my grandfather to go with him. And he would say to him, Bill, come on, come to the gallery with me. Yeah, we can go when we finish the shift. And just if we stay half an hour, maybe I'll hear her. Maybe I'll hear Dorothy. Well, my granddad was a pretty practical man. And he, uh, he'd he known John Bragg since they were boys together. But he'd always thought him a bit uh, fey. I, th I think that was the thing they used to say in those days, a bit uh, otherworldly. And he said, look, when I finish my shift at the pit... I do not want to linger down here. And anyway, the cages will have gone and there won't be one going up till the next shift comes. So uh, unless we can get a special dispensation, but I don't think that's very likely. So he said, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Anyway, he went home and he spoke to my grandmother and he told her what uh, John Bragg had been saying. And my grandmother, Lily, said to him that, you know, that he, she agreed completely with him. He was very foolish. She was a very um, practical woman, very um, a tough woman, really. And they had to be tough. They were poor. They lived in a harsh world. And they were tougher than we are. And so she thought all this was nonsense. And she said, Bill, don't you be going down that mine with him. As soon as you finish, you come back up. Because you've been down in the dark long enough. Time went on. Although the sightings died down a little bit, it somehow this time, John Bragg couldn't get the obsession out of his head that somehow this rustling was connected with Dorothy. It so happened that one particular time, my uh, uncle, Ronnie, was ill when he was just a boy. And they had to go to the doctors. And for some reason, I don't know why, my grandmother couldn't go. I think she was working. She worked in the factory. So my granddad had to take him to the doctors. And he had to um, get some time off to do this. It was nationalised by that time, but there were still some hangovers from the private mines days. And they weren't very, uh, not like today, they weren't very forgiving. And if you know, you worked or you didn't get paid. And of course, they couldn't afford not to get paid. He was talking about this at work, that he had to take Ronnie to the doctors. And John Bragg pipes up. I'll cover your shift for you. He wasn't supposed to be working that day. Don't you worry, Bill. I'll cover your shift for you. Anyway, my granddad was really pleased because it meant that if they just swapped the things, they wouldn't lose out on the money. As I said, they didn't have much money at all. So anyway, that came and went. My uncle is fine. He's still alive today. He's 88. That meant that my granddad owed John Bragg a favour. I don't know how long it was. It wasn't very long. And John Bragg started this business about, let's go down the ladies' gallery. Just come with me, Bill. Come with me after. And my granddad had said, come on, uh, I, I've done enough hours down here in the dark. I don't want to be lingering about here. We'll miss the, the cage up. And anyway, then John Bragg says to him, ah, but Bill, you owe me a favour. Ah, you owe me a favour. Right. So my granddad kind of put it off and he went back to his wife, Lily. And she said, you'd be a fool if you did that. And he says, I know, Lily, but he's right. I owe him a favour. He helped us out when Ronnie was sick and we would have lost out money. I'll only go for an hour or so. 
And she said, I don't think you should go at all. He said, but the thing is, a debt is a debt. I'll pay him back. If all he wants is an hour, then that's what we'll do. And I'll be back up. Of course, he's not going to see anything down there because there's nothing down there. Just foolish people making things up. Maybe somebody heard something once and the rest of them just carry on the rumour for the fun of it, you know. It's only John Bragg that seemed to believe it might possibly be. Well, I say that. Some of the others might have done because there was a superstitious dread of the place. But nobody, nobody believed it was Dorothy. How could it be Dorothy? How did Dorothy end up down a coal mine? She hadn't ever been down a coal mine, as far as I know. So, anyway, the time comes. And my granddad says to John Bragg, OK, well, you're right, I owe you a favour. So what we'll do is we'll go to the ladies' gallery after the shift today. We'll wait one hour and then we'll leave. Anyway, John Bragg seemed overjoyed by this. He seemed to think as soon as he went there, he's going to hear Dorothy or see Dorothy and in some way be reunited with her. So the shift went on, and after the shift, reluctantly, and my granddad went with him. So they went to the ladies' gallery, and then my granddad says, so what now, John, what now? He said, well, we just wait. So they sat there, and they had the electric lamps on their heads and had a battery pack. In the battery, there was enough light for the shift, but a bit more, because you never knew what was going to happen. There would only be an hour tops left in the battery. So and my granddad said, well, we'll wait, and as soon as the battery wanes, we'll go. So they went and they sat down, and they sat in the cold ladies' gallery, and you could hear the dripping of the water somewhere out of sight. Now, the ladies' gallery was a long chamber, but there were side chambers off it, most of which were unused, and they led who knows where, because people have been mining down here at least since the 1700s, if not before. And in some cases, the Romans had mined for coal. I don't know about the ladies' gallery, but there certainly were corridors and passages leading off, and these were quite dangerous because they weren't lit, they hadn't been drained, there may have been rock falls. So nobody went down them. They sat down. And I think my granddad, he told me that basically he was just hoping for a quiet hour, and then they'd go. So he sat there with the lamps getting dimmer and dimmer, and he's looking at his watch, and the time's going on, of course... They didn't hear anything. Of course they didn't. Time went on. Quarter of an hour. Twenty minutes. And then I think my granddad had said to him, Come on, John, let's stop this foolishness. Let's just leave now. We're not going to hear anything. And he said, No, Bill, let's just wait. I know she'll come. And my granddad was like, Well... He didn't want to make fun of the man. He was obviously weak-minded or something. And he always had been, apparently. But they waited. They waited a bit longer. And then my granddad noticed the batteries were getting dim. And he said, listen, John, these batteries aren't going to last. They're not going to last very much longer. Let's go back. We'll get back onto the main, because there was a short walk before they go into the main shaft that led between the, the lift that came down and the coal face three miles away. So let's just go now. Anyway, John Bragg wouldn't have any of this. He said, let's just wait. You promised me an hour, and an hour we're going to stay. You owe me. What could my granddad say? So they waited half an hour, 35 minutes, with the lamps getting dimmer and dimmer. And there'd be nobody there because the shaft, there wasn't anybody due down. The workforce were three miles away. There would be some electricians and the odd people, but they were, they were there. There was no reason for people to be going back and forward. It wasn't, where they were was not a busy place. It was away from any of the main thoroughfares. And then, about 40 minutes in, there's a sound. Well, John Bright picks up his ears. Did you hear that? And my granddad maybe had heard it, but he said, no, I didn't hear anything. Because, to be honest, he didn't want to hear anything. No, I didn't hear anything. No, there was a sound. There was a sound, Bill. There was a sound. From one of those corridors there, one of those passages into the earth. And my granddad's like, oh, come on, John. Really, it wasn't anything. But he could feel himself getting a little bit rattled. So, he waited. And my granddad's fervently praying nothing happens again. And then there's another sound, and this time it's closer. And you can't deny what it was. Did you hear that? Did you hear that, Bill? Well, he couldn't deny what he'd heard. He said, I heard something, I don't know what it was. He said, it was a rustling of silk. And my granddad says, well, don't be daft. What would silk be doing down here? It must have just been a flow of air or something. No, 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 no. It was a rustling of silk, blue silk. And he got out from his wallet the scrap of blue silk that he always kept. And he said, look, this is what it was. This is a scrap from Dorothy's dress. That's Dorothy. She's come back for me, Bill. She's come back for me. Now imagine 
you're in a chamber deep underground away from any company apart from one man who you're beginning to think is insane and it's dark and there's a dripping sound of water but in addition there's a noise that sounds like the rustling of a woman's dress and you can't explain that so my granddad wanted to go. He gets up, he says, no, no, it's not time yet. Bill, you promised me an hour, it's not time. And she's here, she's coming, she's there. And then they hear it closer, closer. And my, my granddad's saying, well, it sounded like she was just outside the glow of the lamp, which weren't bright and they were directional. So they were where you looked. And when he looked, he could see the entrance. And you know what? She said, it looked like a shadow. It looked like there was something there. Now, how could that be? It couldn't be, of course, it couldn't be. And then there's a rustling of silk, just so gentle and faint. And John Bragg says, I'm going, and he gets up and he goes towards it. And my granddad shouts, John, stop, what are you doing, man? The danger is down there. And he says, no, Bill, it's Dorothy. She's there. She's come for me. My granddad, don't, don't, what are you saying? Let's just go. Let's just go. We've had our time. Somebody's playing a trick on us. Somebody, somebody must be down here playing a trick on us. Did you tell somebody you were coming down? I, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell anybody, Bill. It's just you and me know we're down here. No, come on. Somebody's pulling my leg out. You're pulling my leg. This is just a setup, isn't it? You're, trying, you're just having a joke at my expense. But that wasn't true. And he knew it wasn't true. John Brad got up and walked towards the entrance rapturously, as if greeting his long-lost Dorothy. My granddad says, John, come back here. Come back here now, or I'm going to leave. But John Bragg ran into the tunnel. And my granddad said it was as if somebody was in there waiting for him, and they both disappeared. Well, of course, he shouted after him. He shouted and he yelled after him. But he didn't come back. He heard him call him back with the echoes of the tunnel. Sounding like it was getting deeper and deeper into this tunnel. God knows where it led. Just somewhere dark and deep and dangerous. Somewhere lost and forgotten. Somewhere where people hadn't been for years, decades, maybe even a century. God knows what was lurking down there. And my granddad said, and he wasn't a coward, because nobody goes three miles under the sea in the dark and hews coal if they're a coward. But he said his courage failed him and he couldn't and he wouldn't follow John down wherever that rustling had taken him well he waited and of course he was looking at his watch and the battery was failing and he knew that if the battery went it would be so dark he'd never find his way out so he stood and he shouted john john let's be going come on john come back john but there was no answer and so he waited some more and the battery faded. It wasn't a bright light now, it was a very dim light. And he waited and he knew if he waited any longer he was going to be stuck there. So he yelled one last time, John Bragg, enough of your foolishness. Come back now, I'm leaving. But there was no reply. So, with great tribulation and conscience, but knowing that if he stayed down there, he, he might actually die down there. He might never find his way out. So with the last light of his fading battery of the bulb on his miner's headlamp, he turned and went, and what was in his mind was, he would go to the bottom, he would wait at the bottom of the, of the shaft, there was, there was a way of communicating, even, even in the 60s they had radio, so there would, was a telephone or something, he said. It wouldn't be radio, it would probably be wired. So uh, he, he would go there, and that was his plan, and he would call for help, and they'd go and look for the missing John Bragg, and get him what kind of help he needed. First of all, they need to find him, then they need to bring him back and then to get him some psychiatric treatment or something. And he felt bad that he'd indulged him in this, but, you know, the guy had played on this issue of you owe me. So anyway, my granddad walked with the failing light of his helmet. And at, at the edge of the ladies' gallery, where the tunnel led in a twisty sort of way to the main thoroughfare and then back to the lift, he turned and he looked down in the direction that John Bragg had gone. And he yelled one last time. And do you know what he said? And he said it was almost as if, standing there, just at the edge of the light, was a shape. And he thought it might be John, but he knew it wasn't. 
because it wasn't the shape of a man, he said. It was the shape of a woman. And in the light, he thought, he saw her wearing a blue silk dress. Well, that was enough for him, and he turned, and he ran, and he ran, and he got back to the bottom of the shaft, waiting by the elevator. And he said he was panting, and he didn't know what to make of it. He was terrified. And he rang the telephone at the bottom, and he called up and said he was down. Well, of course, they wondered what he was doing, but they sent the elevator down for him. Now, it so happened that the safety inspector there was a guy called Jack Tubman. Now, Jack Tubman was near retirement, and he came down, and he was another guy with him who, I don't know the name of the other guy, but there were two of them anyway, and he came down, and he says, what are you doing down here, Bill Fell? What are you doing down here? And he told him the full story. He said, well, I'm here with John Bragg, and he wanted to stop in the ladies' gallery, and I owed him a favour, and he had this mad idea that the rustling of the silk, this so-called ghost, was his Dorothy. And Jack Tubman looked at him and said, you must be crazy. And the other fellow said, what, in the ladies' gallery? In the ladies' gallery? What on earth possessed you to go there? And he said, well, what could I do? Anyway. He says, you, Bill Fell, you get up there now. We'll go and look for him. Your battery's nearly gone anyway. You get up there, you go home, go back to your wife. You've got work to do in the morning, so come back in the morning. Anyway. So my granddad went home, and he had his bath, and he had his supper. And he told Lily what had happened. And she told him he was a fool. But she loved him anyway. Sleep, but he couldn't get to sleep. So the next day, he was on a back shift, and he wasn't due to start till 2pm. So in the morning, he was at home, and there was a knock on the door. And Lily opened the door, and she called back, Bill, it's for you. It's Jack Tubman. Well, anyway, Jack Tubman had come. And he came in, and he said, Listen, Bill, I want you to sit down. So they sat down in, in the parlour that my nana kept super clean, just for visitors. And they sat down there, and he said, I'm sorry, I've got some bad news. And he said, oh, I, what? Have you found him? Hi, we found him. And is he alive? No, he's not alive. And Bill knew what the answer would be before he was spoken. He says, no, no, I'm sorry, Bill. He's not alive. And my granddad said, so what, what was the, what killed him? What was the cause of death? He says, well, we don't know, to be honest. When we looked at it, there wasn't any obvious cause of death. There wasn't a mark on his body. Just his eyes, really. He said, what do you mean, his eyes? Well, he was staring. Anyway, I shouldn't tell you this, it'll disturb you, but I'm not a lad. You owe it to me to tell me straight. Come on, Jack. We've known each other a long time. He says, well, I, he says, his eyes looked like uh, he'd been frightened to death. You know, he believed it was Dorothy, you know, his long lost love that was down there. And Jack Tubman shook his head firmly and he said, well, whatever it was down there that he met, he said, that thing's been down there ever since the first shaft was sunk. And whether it came down with us, whether it was there waiting for us when we dug down. There's one thing that's certain. Whatever he met there down that dark, lonely tunnel, it wasn't Dorothy. So there we have it. Apparently it's a true story. The mine's shut now. She's sealed off. You can't get down. Maybe that's just as well. This is the story of the haunting of the Eden Hall Hotel. The Eden Hall Hotel lies just to the east of the town of Penrith on its own in quite a secluded area. 
not far from the banks of the River Eden, and it mainly serves fishermen who go there fishing for trout and salmon. I came across the place in 1997, and I was writing a book called The Ghostly Guide to the Lake District. I interviewed a number of the staff there for this book, and at that time I was working for the tourist board, and I'd always had an interest in ghosts and haunting, so I decided I'd write a book called The Ghostly Guide to the Lake District, and the purpose of this book was to direct people so that they could go and stay in haunted hotels and other haunted places. This was 1997, and it had just been taken over by a guy called Richard Burton. I kid you not, that was his real name. Richard Burton and an anonymous business partner had just bought the Eaton Hall Hotel from two old ladies who'd owned it since the 1950s. The two old ladies told them that the hotel was haunted, but of course this didn't put them off, and they said it was haunted by two women and a man. Well, I interviewed others of the staff, as you'll hear, uh, but my main source of information was Richard Burton. So when he moved in, he decided to convert one of the attics uh, into a kind of a bedroom. It wouldn't be his main home, but if he'd been working late on a shift, he'd go and stay up there. Well, the locals in the bar tried to put him off. Uh, they said that it was a haunted uh, attic and that he wouldn't want to stay there. Well, the carpenters who were making the changes to the attic and the builders there felt very uncomfortable. They didn't like being in the place and they, uh, to a man, said that, that they felt it was haunted. Well, Richard took no notice of this and he moved in shortly after they'd finished, but he only stayed there five weeks because he couldn't bear to be in that attic because he believed that there was somebody there watching him. He also told me that in the main body of the hotel, sometimes when he was having a bit of a nap after a busy shift, he would wake up and with the feeling that he was being watched. One of the uh, barmaids, Teresa, said that she'd seen a man carrying a pint glass of beer walk across the bar and suddenly disappear. There were some maids who went up to room 38 and they would split up and do the different rooms and one of them went up to 38 and she said that she thought it was empty, walked in, saw somebody in the room, uh, apologised and went out again. And then she thought, well, that room is empty, so who the heck is in the room? And she went back in, and of course, the room was now empty. So she was convinced that she'd seen a ghost. Another of the barmaids was a lady called Claire, and she would sometimes stay, after she'd worked a late shift, she would stay in one of the staff bedrooms there, one of the uh, not great quality bedrooms that they hadn't got done up for paying guests and the staff were allowed to stay there. When I worked in hotels, that's the kind of place I would stay, but I never worked in this hotel. So anyway, Claire had finished on the bar and she believed that another of the barmaids was walking up the steep stairs uh, in front of her. But when she got up there, um, there was nobody there. Another of the staff there, a lady called Irene, complained that she used to see people moving in the mirrors. But the best story concerns room 25. Now, room 25 was one of those rooms that hadn't been decorated since about the 1960s, and it was used for the staff. In the early 1990s, there was a waiter who worked there, and he was assigned room 25 to live in. He was very frightened of the room to the extent that he asked the cook for a lot of garlic and ended up festooning the room with garlic cloves and even with wild garlic that he collected from the nearby stream and woods. One day he told them he couldn't work there anymore. He gave no reason and simply left. It was never explained why he'd left, but it seems at least possible that it was due to the ghost in the room. The ghost in this room had been seen by a number of people and it was said that she came out of the mirror that sat just above the bath in the bathroom. That was weird enough, but in the 1980s, before even the waiter had gone there, there were other people that used to stay there. In the 1980s, the local member of parliament was a man called Sir William Whitelaw, and he was quite famous in his time. He was the most trusted advisor of the prime minister Margaret Thatcher, but he was the MP for the local area and he was born and brought up in the local area. So he would come back from London and stay in his hall, mansion, not too far away, uh, but he didn't have room for all his aides and bodyguards and things, and so some of them would stay in the properties around about. 
One man would always stay in the Eden Hall Hotel, and furthermore, he would always ask for room 25. Jokingly, because they got to know him quite well, when one of, the, one of the staff asked him when he was booking in why he always insisted on room 25, didn't he know that it was haunted? He said, yes, he did know that it was haunted. And they asked him whether he'd seen the ghost, and he said, yes, I have seen the ghost. And furthermore, that is the reason why I want to stay in room 25. And they were a bit taken aback at this. And he said, the ghost comes out of the mirror, and we chat, and she tells me things. Well, what she told him, he never let on, but it was clearly very interesting because he always booked to come and stay in room 25. And then, one day, it got even more mysterious because he simply vanished. Now, it could be that he left and went somewhere else, but he left all his possessions in the room and nobody ever came to collect them. Well, of course, they got the police involved, but there was no murder, there was no foul play, there was no body, there was no suspicion that anything had happened. So they came up with all sorts of theories why he suddenly left in the middle of the night and left all these possessions in room 25. But you know what my theory is? My theory is that once again, the woman came out of the mirror to talk to him, but this time he agreed to go back into the mirror with her. Five chilling instances of slips in time. Urban legend, nonsense, or something more. Time anomalies, otherwise known as temporal distortions or time slips, have long been an interest of mine. The first time I remember taking a definite interest was when I was writing a book called The Ghostly Guide to the Lake District. As well as collecting local folklore and well-known legends, I wanted to bring the material up to date and demonstrate that people continue to have paranormal experiences. I wrote the book in 1998 and I put a notice in a local newspaper asking people to get in touch. A woman called Angela Charlton did get in touch. At the time I was living in a town called Penrith in Cumbria in England. Stranger still, at the time she had the time slip experience. She lived in the same house I was living in when I wrote the book. So Penrith, Cumbria. Angela reported a strange experience as she walked on a steep path between pine trees up to the top of Beacon Hill that overlooks Penrith. At the time, she was a teenager. Angela would often climb the beacon when she wasn't at school, and it's still a popular local walk. One hot day in August in the mid-1970s, Angela and a friend set out on the footpath from Beacon Edge. The walk takes about 15 minutes, and the path has many abrupt angles as it zigzags through the trees. The trees crowd thickly round the track as it climbs over the craggy sandstone outcrops. Soon, you feel quite apart from the everyday world. It's an odd feeling, and you can have the impression that someone is watching you from the woods on either side. You go up and up, changing direction and losing sight of the path below and behind you. As Angela and her friend climbed that day, they chatted away, but Angela reports how the atmosphere grew increasingly heavy, as if there was thunder in the air. They'd walked up that way many times and weren't taking much notice of their surroundings until they turned the corner and stopped. They both saw it, an old-fashioned cottage, roughly made of stone. Angela says that it was like a dwelling from the Middle Ages. The trouble was, there had never been a cottage there before on the times they climbed. Smoke was coming from the chimney this day, so someone was at home. Angela says that there was a very uncanny 
weird feeling about the place. She looked at her friend and, as the door began to open, they both ran away. When she worked up the courage to climb the hill some months later, the cottage wasn't there. Her friend would never talk about the experience. As you would imagine, in the years since, I've taken one or two walks up that path in the snow and the sun, but I've never had the slightest inkling of a time anomaly. Pembroke, Wales. Over the next few years, I taught an evening class on ghosts and legends for adults. I told the story of Angela Charlton, and one man, Roger, whom I happened to know from outside the class, told me his tale. Roger said that he and his family had visited Pembroke Castle in Wales. They were climbing the tower and he was a flight or two above his family on the staircase. When he reached the top of the castle tower, he glanced out over the river and saw it was full of medieval looking boats. He thought there must be some kind of festival or pageant on, but when he remarked on it, not only had his family not noticed, but when they went out to look at the river, there were no boats. Roger had no explanation for this and didn't make a big deal of it. He probably wouldn't have mentioned it at all if I hadn't told him the story about the girls climbing the hill in Penrith. Leeds Castle in Kent. Also in a castle, though they don't all happen in castles, far from it. There is a story of Alice Pollock, born 1868 and died 1971, who visited Leeds Castle in Kent. Pollock was born into the minor aristocracy and this might have allowed her entry into Leeds Castle at a time when it wasn't generally open to the public. Leeds Castle is a famous and picturesque castle not far from London. Alice Pollock was psychic and she was trying out some psychometry in Henry VIII's old room. Psychometry is a technique where a psychic will touch an object and learn about its history from the impressions they pick up. Touching various objects in Leeds Castle propelled Alice back into the past. The castle changed and became cold and bare. The carpet vanished and there was a blazing fire piled with logs. Alice saw a tall woman pacing back and forth in the room, apparently lost in concentration. And then, in an instant, all returned to normal. Later research informed Alice that the room in which she had had the vision had been the prison room of Joan of Navarre, 1368 to 1437. Joan of Navarre was Henry V's stepmother, who was imprisoned after being accused of plotting against the king. She was found innocent and released, ultimately. An adventure. One of the most famous accounts of a time slip is reported in a book called An Adventure. An Adventure was initially published in 1910 and gives the accounts of two English women who experienced a time slip in the gardens of the Palace of Versailles, just outside Paris, on August the 10th, 1901. They wrote the book under false names. They called themselves Elizabeth Morrison and Francis Lamont, though their actual names were Charlotte Moberly, born 1846 and died 1937, and Eleanor Jourdain, born 1863 and died in 1924. Mobley's father was headmaster at the prestigious Winchester School and was later Bishop of Salisbury. In her account, she distances herself from a belief in ghosts and the occult, and at that time there was an epidemic of spiritualism sweeping Britain and America. Jordan's father was a vicar in the Church of England. On August the 10th, they felt they'd walked through the gardens as they were on August the 10th, 1792, which was the day the French monarchy fell during the French Revolution. This account is remarkable for the detail of the statements of the two women and the efforts they went to to establish the historical evidence for their belief that they'd strayed into the past. The two women met three months after they visited Versailles and talked it over again. It was at this time that they discovered that Jordan had not seen the lady and that Miss Mobley had not seen the plough, cottage, woman or girl, so they'd seen different things from each other. Because of this, they went and sat apart and wrote separate accounts without conferring. This fact strongly suggests to me that they were not making up their experience. 
Miss Lamont, in her story, used the words uncanny and eerie to describe her feelings. But at the time, she denied any thought that any of the people or places encountered were unreal or ghostly. So when she was there on that day, although it felt strange, and she thought that the people she met looked odd, it didn't occur to her that they were ghosts or supernatural creatures. They appeared to be everyday people, just not the same day. Bolt Street, Liverpool. One of the most famous recent time slips is that of Bolt Street in Liverpool. And this happened on a sunny day in July 1996, and an off-duty policeman called Frank went shopping with his wife Carol in Liverpool city centre. Carol went to buy a copy of Irvin Welsh's book Train Spotting at Dylan's bookshop on Bolt Street, and Frank went to buy a CD at the HMV record store on Ranhollow Street. He bumped into a friend, had a chat, and then, about 20 minutes later, he strolled over to Bolt Street to meet his wife. Upon strolling up the incline from the central station, he noticed an unusual quietness. Frank saw that the street was cobbled, and he'd never seen it like that before. And instead of modern clothes, people wore clothes that he recognised from about the 1950s. And as he was looking around him, he was startled by a loud horn, and a box fan with the name Kaplins on its side sped past, and it just missed him, and that's why he remembered it so clearly. Crossing the road, Frank saw in place of Dylan's bookshop was a large store with the name Crips over its two entrances, with a window display containing women's handbags and shoes. Just then, Frank saw a young woman dressed in the clothes of the mid-90s, hipster jeans and a sleeveless top. She also carried a bag branded with Miss Selfridge, a store that wasn't in Liverpool in the 1950s. This modern girl entered Crips looking baffled and suddenly the whole scene reverted to modern days, 1996. Frank asked the young woman if she'd seen the same things that he'd seen. She said she had and she seemed frightened. Later, it transpired that a women's outfit is called Crips had indeed stood on the site of Dylan's bookshop in the 1950s. This account is remarkable because of the detail. We know the month and the year, the first names of the two people, the names on the signs, and exactly what book Carol was going to buy. It's a pity we don't know their surnames. When you look through the internet, you see many versions of this story but the original was written by a journalist called Tom Sleeman, who collected supernatural tales from the Liverpool area. And it doesn't appear that either Frank or Carol ever spoke to anyone else except Tom Sleeman about this incident. I think when we're talking about extraordinary things, such as time slips, we have to be careful. It seems to me that there are three possibilities. Firstly, the people who report these accounts of time-slip phenomena are giving a reliable account on an objective happening. This is called the truth. Or they are offering an unreliable account of what they thought was happening, and this is called being mistaken. Or they are deliberately attempting to mislead us, and this is called lying. I don't think there is a fourth possibility. But if anyone can think of one, let me know. Let us consider whether it makes sense that they might all be lying. Like on the TV cop shows, it will be helpful to remember that when we're trying to understand why people do what they do, we should follow the money. But I don't think there is any money. None of these people seems to have made a penny out of reporting these incidents, or at least not a substantial amount a few book sales notwithstanding. Furthermore, any money they did make would be outweighed by the scorn that would be heaped on them. People are speedy to mock others who report any kind of unusual occurrence, so it would actually make sense to keep quiet. The only reason someone might speak up despite the mockery is that the experience is so far outside your normal everyday life that you have to talk about it. 
it's this fact that persuades me that the people at least really believed they experienced what they reported. So for the record, I don't think they are lying. Further than that, I can't go. The detail seems too much and the experience too prolonged to be an illusion. But that's me. For me, I own up to the fact that I believe time slips happen. Usually, after admitting they believe in time slips, the author of an article or a book spends many pages setting out half-baked personal theories about how this could happen. And this mostly involves citing some half-comprehended stuff about quantum physics. I don't know much about quantum physics, so I won't try and explain any of this by referring to it. I believe time slips happen, but I don't know how. It's pretty much my attitude to bumblebees too. I believe they happen, but I have no clue how they work. Just because it's rare doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Meteorites don't strike the earth every day, but they do every now and again. And just because something has never been my personal experience is no reason to believe it can't happen at all. For example, I've never seen the Northern Lights, but I don't accuse people of being liars when they say they have. Nor do I insist that all photographs of the Northern Lights are fake. So why don't I disbelieve the Northern Lights? Because there are so many photographs of them. This implies that truth is just a numbers game. But are we really saying it's just numbers or social proof that makes something right? I hope not. But more and more I fear the truth is down to what social media influencers say it is. And that gives me vertigo. As you reflect on these accounts, it might be that if these time slips really happened, then that is a challenge to your worldview. Thomas Kuhn is often cited in this regard. He wrote a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, but his theory can apply to any worldview. Kuhn describes how there's an accepted theory of how the world is, one that is widely held, and people accept it without thinking about it. For example, at one time, most people believed that the world was flat or that the sun revolved around the earth. Now, we believe something else mostly. But then, in any worldview, anomalies crop up and Kuhn says, at first, people shout them down. But then, there are so many anomalies that the original theory gets undermined and collapses because the original theory cannot explain these new events. A theory remains true for most people until the influence has abandoned it. After that, we all get a new worldview. For a while, anyway. So, if time slips really happen, as these witnesses seem to believe, and if you refuse to accept it, that either means they are wrong, or your worldview is about to collapse. You better check the truth on Instagram. mysterious time slip cases. Further examples of time slips. The overwhelming popularity of my first article on time slips on Medium, with all the wonderful responses and fresh personal examples of the phenomenon it generated, has shown that there is an audience hungry to read about these bizarre incidents. And I've saved the best ones until now. The Kersey Village Time Slip. This fascinating account is drawn from Andrew McKenzie's book, Adventures in Time, published 1997. The story goes that in 1957, three young men, cadets in the Royal Navy, were on a training exercise in the county of Suffolk. The three cadets were 15 years old. They were Ray Baker from London, William Lang from Perthshire in Scotland, and Michael Crowley from Worcestershire. 
Once again, we have a lot of detail about the people who experienced these events. It was a Sunday in October, but not Halloween, and they were deep in the country. They were on a training exercise that asked them to map read a route to a waypoint, hike over to it, note what they found there and come back. On the way to the waypoint, they came across the village of Kersey, and as they approached, they noticed the normal sights and sounds of a Sunday morning in rural England, the church spire, smoke coming from the chimneys, and the sound of the bells tolling. However, as they got closer, it appeared that something strange was going on. The first thing that they noticed was the silence. The church bells faded out as they crested the hill on their way into the village, and then the autumn bird song from the woods cut off. The cadets also noticed that the wind died entirely away, and no further smoke rose from the chimneys. No smoke at all. Weirdly, the three boys said that everything appeared flat and two-dimensional, and the trees cast no shadows in the pale sunlight. They even said the ducks froze in place on the shallow stream that ran across the road at the end of the village's main street. Kersey's few streets were deserted. Nobody was hurrying to church, nobody out chatting with neighbours or clipping their hedges. In fact, the cadets saw not a living soul as they wandered through the eerie village. They remarked how old the houses looked. There were no wires, no aerials, no signs of TV or modern conveniences. And the houses were rough, hand-built and timber-framed like they come from the Middle Ages. They also commented that the season had changed. They'd been walking through the autumn countryside, but instead of reds and yellows, in the quiet village all was green, as if it were spring or summer. They walked up to the window of the nearby house. The window was dirty, but they could see through and noticed three whole carcasses hanging up. One account says that the carcasses were oxen, though I'm not sure how they'd know. They were green with age. The boys knew that no modern butcher's shop looked like this, and it appeared to be a scene from a more primitive time and place. It didn't seem feasible that modern health regulators would allow such a place to operate. There was no sign of anyone living in the house which had a wooden door and small, multi-paned windows. What they had seen in this strange village really freaked them out, and they turned and hurried up the track to the hill. As they left the village boundary, still without seeing anyone, the church bells began to ring again, and as they turned, smoke rose from the chimneys, and everything was normal. Years later, one of the cadets, William Lang, said, it was a ghost village, so to speak. It was almost as if we had walked back in time. I experienced an overwhelming feeling of sadness and depression in Kersey, but also a feeling of unfriendliness and unseen watchers who had sent shivers at one's back. I wondered if we'd knocked at the door to ask a question. Who might have answered it? It doesn't bear thinking about. They all felt that something extraordinary had happened. Later, Andrew McKenzie investigated the case for his book and found that the house identified as the dirty-looking butcher's shop was a private house in 1957 and certainly wouldn't have three ox carcasses hanging up in the front room. However, in 1790, there was documentary evidence that it had been a butcher's shop then and possibly for centuries before. Also, the windows were small paned, and though that could be an antique feature in a modern house, in the past, the windows were small pane because they didn't have the technology to manufacture the big panes of glass we have these days. Another feature was that the cadets didn't notice a church in the village, though the current church has a prominent steeple and should have been evident. Also, they remember the church bell stopped as they entered the past, if it was the past, and started again when they came back to 1957. In fact, the church in Kersey didn't have a bell tower until around 1420. At that time, there would have been some glazed windows as Kersey profited from the wool industry. Mackenzie's view was that the boys had gone stumbling into Kersey as it was during the Great Plague of the 1420s, and hence, that was why it's so quiet. Another time slip comes from France. The next story dates from 1979, and again, we have a good amount of detail, as with the Kersey village case, we know precisely who the witnesses were and have their full names. It was October again, and I don't know if the incident occurred over Halloween, though I think not. Two couples, friends, decided to go on holiday to France. 
They were Len and Cynthia Gisby and Jeff and Pauline Simpson. They took one car and planned to cross from Dover in England, then drive down through France, crossing the Spanish border, where they would have two weeks in Spain, then return. The journey was perfectly normal until the evening of October the 3rd, 1979. They were driving in the area of Avignon on their way south and had been traveling all day. The weather grew dreadful and they decided due to fatigue and poor visibility that they would pull off the auto route, find somewhere local to stay one night, then set off early the next day when they hoped the weather would be improved. It was 9.30 p.m. when they saw a motel. Len left the others and went in to inquire about rooms and prices. The man who greeted him wore a bright plum-coloured uniform and said there were no rooms, but he advised Len that there was another hotel a little further down the road. Len returned to the car and they drove on. The streets were cobbled and very narrow, and they saw a poster advertising a circus that seemed old-fashioned in design. The couples drove further down the old-looking street until they came to a low building blazing with lights. They wondered if this was the hotel they'd been directed to, but some men outside said that this was an inn, not a hotel. They drove on again, passing a police station, and then finding an old-fashioned two-story building with the sign Hotel outside. It was made of heavy wood, not brick. The hotel was rather primitive in feel. There were no tablecloths on the tables, no telephones, and no lift. When they went to their rooms, they found the beds had no pillows and there were no locks on the doors. It was not en suite. The couple shared a bathroom with distinctly old plumbing. Even more extraordinary was that their bedroom windows had only wooden shutters and no glass. They ate that night at the hotel and said the food was excellent and thinking nothing more went to bed early and slept well. When they woke, they went down to have breakfast and said the coffee was nasty. In the hotel lounge were two French policemen wearing very old-fashioned looking uniforms, deep blue with capes over their shoulders. A woman came in wearing a silk evening gown and button boots carrying a little dog under her arm. She chatted with the policemen as if they were well known to each other. She looked like she'd just returned from a ball. Len and Jeff took some photographs of their wives outside the old-fashioned hotel as a souvenir. And when they came to pay, the whole stay with dinner, bed and breakfast for four of them was 19 francs, which seemed very cheap, even in 1979. Before setting off, Len asked the landlord for directions, but the landlord didn't seem to understand what he meant by auto route, the French for motorway or freeway. He gave them directions which put them on the old road rather than on the modern one. On their way back from Spain after their two-week holiday, they decided that the stay in the hotel was so different that they'd look it up on the way back. They found the first motel, but there was no one wearing such ornate plum-coloured uniforms, and the staff there said they knew no one of the man's description. They couldn't find the second hotel, the one they'd stayed in. Not at all. Instead, they stayed at a hotel near Lyon, and dinner, bed and breakfast of four of them cost 247 francs. One further little twist was when they went home and got the films from their cameras developed, as you used to have to do, the photographs taken outside the quaint hotel had disappeared entirely as if they'd never been taken at all. It wasn't as if there were any photographs missing from the reels. The reels were full up. It was just as if the pictures of the odd hotel never happened. So the third time slip here is about a Scottish battle. And this story is again from Andrew Mackenzie, but from his book Hauntings and Apparitions, page 163. On January the 2nd, 1950, a lady called Miss Elizabeth F. Smith, who was then 55, went to a cocktail party in the small town of Brecon. She lived 10 miles away at Leitham under Dunnigan Hill. Miss Smith had a good time at the party, and a few drinks, no doubt, and drove the 10 miles home with alcohol on board, as everyone, including my dad, used to do back then. She had her terrier dog with her in the car. It had been snowing, but the snow had turned to rain, and of course it was pitch black. Just two miles outside of Brecon, she skidded and her car got stuck in a ditch. This accident had nothing to do with the cocktails, she claimed. She didn't faint, nor did she bang her head or suffer any other injuries, but as her car wasn't coming out of the ditch, she decided to walk home. The dog was uninjured too. She walked seven and a half miles through the dark, wet, cold night and was half a mile from her home village of Leitham. She turned the corner and saw Dunnigan Hill. 
Something was going on on the slope of the hill, and she could see groups of lights which turned out to be figures wandering about carrying flaming torches. She said the torches were very long and very red, and she thought they were made of tar. In fact, the torches of ancient Scotland were made of Scots fur, which is distinctly red, though she didn't know that. As she got closer, she saw another group of figures to her right, about a third of a mile away. Then there were other figures about 50 yards away. Now, she knew there were farm buildings there, but there was no sign of the buildings that night. Just these people wandering around with their torches. She said the people were dressed in dark clothes, but she admits that it was a dark night, and they seemed to be wearing dark tights as a kind of overall with a roll collar. And at the end of their tunics, there was a larger roll around them too. She couldn't say what they had on their feet, except that they weren't wearing boots. She saw the people wandering around, and saw they were turning over bodies on the ground, lots of bodies. She had the impression that these people with torches were searching for the faces of their own dead. The dog was unhappy, and his hackles rose and he started to growl. She thought he would begin to bark. She managed to keep him quiet and hurried on her way. She had no interaction with the figures. Later research suggested that what Miss Smith saw was the aftermath of the Battle of Nechansmere, with the relatives of the warriors searching for their kin, or nastia, looting bodies. No one knows the precise site of this battle, but one candidate is Dunnikin Hill, near Forfar, in Angus. But there is no loch or lake nearby. Subsequently, some scholars now think that the battle took place at Donachton, a lot further north. The Battle of Nechansmere took place on May 20th, 685, and was a resounding victory of the Picts over the invading Anglo-Saxons from Northumbria. Writing over 50 years later, the Anglo-Saxon monk Bede gives the fullest account of the battle. There is an account in the Welsh annals which records the battle as Gwaith Lyn Garan, meaning the Battle of Heron Lake, which was probably the Pictish name, as Pictish and Welsh were very close. Though there's no loch there now, there had been a lake that was drained. This loch refills at times of very wet weather. Miss Smith says that the figures appear to be skirting a lake, and her description places them where the drained loch used to be. The ancient name of the site was Don Nechten. There's a record that after the battle, the Picts kept identifying and burying their dead by torchlight until the early hours. Whatever happened, Miss Smith made no claims that she had seen the Battle of Nechansmere, or made any claims at all other than she saw what she saw. Conclusion I like to finish these pieces with a personal anecdote. Four years ago, in 2016, I went to an event at the village hall at Warwick Bridge near Carlisle. One of the speakers was a Geordie chap called Noel Sorby, who had worked as a psychic medium for many years. He told a story that appeared spontaneous and unrehearsed about a time he'd gone to Germany. I tell this story because it reminds me of the French types of the story above. Noel said he'd been in the army. He was a tough, down-to-earth, working-class bloke, and his psychic powers burst on him by surprise. He eventually left the army, but kept in touch with his friends. One of his pals was very sceptical, and invited Noel to go and give a talk at the sergeant's mess. The army buddy was stationed in Germany in the British Army of the Rhine, part of NATO. The talk went well, and the next day the army man was giving Noel a lift to the airport, and they happened to be on the autobahn. The army man noticed his Land Rover had very little fuel and cursed because there was no service station on that stretch of the autobahn. Noel said, don't worry, there's one coming up. But the sergeant told him he knew this stretch of the autobahn well, and there was nowhere to fuel up for miles. But sure enough, very shortly, there was a sign for fuel, and they pulled off and fueled up. The sergeant was astounded because there never had been a petrol station here before. He recognised nothing about it. They paid, and how and did he get a receipt, and went on their way. The petrol was real, the Land Rover kept running, but a week or so later, the sergeant got in contact with Noel to tell him that the petrol station had vanished. It wasn't there before, and it wasn't there after. It just appeared in their time of need. And that, dear listeners, is a true story.
phone calls from the dead. Apparently the dead are always reaching out to us. They move your fingers around the Ouija board, they rap on your tables, and they even call you on your telephone. To me, the weirdest of these communication methods are telephone calls from the dead. I know some readers will be tutting in disbelief, and yet others nodding eagerly. I imagine you both. The trouble is with strange phenomena like this that the sceptic simply won't believe in them, whatever evidence is presented, while the credulous person believes them too quickly, despite often jarring inconsistencies. Ultimately, we need to find some way to be open-minded enough to learn something about the universe from these incidents, but tough-minded enough so we're not taken for a ride. This phenomenon of having someone who's passed away ring you up on your mobile phone is not amenable to the experimental studies because phone calls from the dead happen out of the blue and present themselves as mere anecdotes. Scientifically-minded people tend to look down their noses at anecdotes. However, as well as the experimental methods, science also perfectly respectably collects examples and arranges these examples into taxonomies. That is to say, it puts them in categories and groups and looks for similarities and patterns. After all, that's what Darwin did on his trips to the Galapagos Islands and elsewhere. All the creatures he catalogued were just anecdotes back in England. So, I think we need to be careful not to dismiss phone calls from the dead out of hand. Indeed, we might learn something if we can look at them objectively. The classic study into this phenomenon was contained in a 1979 book which is now hard to get hold of. The book was called simply Phone Calls from the Dead, written by parapsychologists D. Scott Rogo and Raymond Bayliss. As a point of note, D. Scott Rogo was later murdered in August 1990 in Northridge, aged only 40, and his murderer was never found. We might suspect a curse such as a curse that dogged the team that found Tutankhamun or the film crew and actors who made The Exorcist. But Rogo's co-author, Raymond Bayliss, lived until he was 84 and passed away quite naturally in Los Angeles in 2004. In the book, Rogo and Bayliss attempted to categorise the different types of calls. They divided the calls into three categories. One, apparent phone calls from the dead. In this type of call, a living person receives a call from someone who has recently died, or in fact has been dead for some time. The person receiving the call may or may not know that the caller is dead. Many of these examples are taken from the internet. Janae S. reports that her eldest brother's friend Joe died of a heart attack. Then one night, there was a call to their house from someone who sounded exactly like Joe, asking to speak to her eldest brother, who wasn't in, saying... Something strange is going on. When told the brother wasn't in, sounder like Joe hung up the phone. The caller ID said out of area and was not traceable. Dating from the 1990s, Betty, surname unknown, tells how she got a call at her new workplace. The call rang through on the phone of a co-worker, Mary, who was out for lunch. A man's voice asked for Mary by a nickname before correcting himself and formally asking for her with her given name. Betty said Mary was away from her desk at present, and the man said, Could you tell her that this is her brother? I really missed her at the family gathering, and I wished that she'd gone. When Mary came back from lunch, Betty innocently passed on the message, but to her complete surprise, Mary fell to pieces. When Mary finally composed herself, she said that her brother had died in a car wreck five years previously. There had been a family reunion two weeks before, but she hadn't made it. When Betty told her that the man initially asked for Mary by a nickname, Mary confirmed that that was the name her brother, but very few others, always called her. Bonnie O. reports that her deceased mother rang her on Christmas Eve. Her mother had been dead three years, but apparently didn't know she was dead, because when Bonnie said, This can't be you, Mum, you're dead, her mother said, Oh, come on now, and became agitated that Bonnie thought she was dead, and then the line was cut off. Bonnie says her mom had an unmistakable Norwegian accent and she was sure it was her. Bonnie also said the line had a lot of static on it and the volume cut in and out. Category 2. Intention Cases 
In an intention call, there's an urgent message which is often a warning from a friend or relative. Initially, the call seems perfectly normal, but later the receiver of the call finds out that the person who rang them never actually made the call, though they firmly intended to. In these cases, the voice on the line is often described as strange or drunk or mechanical. In any case, there's something off about it. This mechanical voice reminds me of the voice of the mothman on the phone, or like the strangely artificial look of the skin or clothes of the men in black in UFO cases. Reverend Carl Hewitt, a psychic medium, relates one case from his book A Medium's Diary. Reverend Hewitt was so busy in those days that he employed a secretary to manage his appointments. One day she had a strange call, and when asked what was weird about it, she said, it didn't sound like a human voice. The content of the call was relatively normal. The voice had asked for an appointment for a psychic reading with Reverend Hewitt. When the secretary phoned back the day before the meeting to confirm with the man, Robert, he was blisteringly angry because he said he'd never spoken to her before and had made no such appointment, and furthermore, he didn't believe in that kind of thing. Still, he agreed to come to the meeting. Robert remained angry when he arrived the next day, but as he spoke, Reverend Hewitt became psychically aware that a young man called Fred was standing behind Robert. When Reverend Hewitt finally got Robert quiet, Fred asked Hewitt to pass on the message that he, Robert's son, had never committed suicide as his father believed. This case, I guess, is harder to swallow for the sceptic because it was reported by a psychic medium, a group of people sceptics generally pay no heed to. But otherwise, it falls into the intention category of phone calls from the dead. A similar intention case was reported as a blog post by Sandra Brand Wilson. She tells that her husband, Kenny, received a call from his boss. What he didn't know was that his boss had already committed suicide about an hour earlier. A husband's boss was in tears and said, help me, Kenny. But at the time the call was made, the poor man was already gone. Perhaps the most famous intention case was made to horror author Dean Kuntz, as recounted by his biographer, Catherine Ramsland. On September 20th, 1988, Dean Kuntz was at work when the phone rang. It was a female voice that sounded far away, and the voice said in an urgent tone, please be careful. She said it three more times, but didn't respond to Dean's questions about who she was. In the end, the line got cut off. Dean felt the voice sounded like his deceased grandmother. His number was unlisted, so it didn't seem possible it was a prank aimed deliberately at him. Two days later, Dean went to visit his father, who lived in the facility for people with dementia. His father had a fishing knife, and in his confused state, he slashed at Dean. Dean got the knife off him safely, but as he did so, the police appeared and trained their guns on him, thinking he was trying to assault this older man. Dean says he realised he was within a hair's breadth of getting shot. Later, he linked that near-fatal incident to the warning he'd received over the phone. In another article, I talk about my visit to Grisdale Forest. What I forgot to mention was that when we went there, the young women who worked in the theatre office told of calls that they would get on their mobiles while out in Kendall. When they answered, it was a strange woman's voice who would ask them to help her, though they never got any detail about what help she actually wanted. Just help me, help me, please. The number on the phone was from their office back at Grisdale, an office that should have been locked and empty. Coast to Coast AM radio host George Noory, in his book Talking to the Dead, reports a case from a woman called Beth. Beth said that her father had passed away in a car accident, and then several years after she was at home alone and the phone rang. The line had a lot of static on it, and the voice sounded distant like it was coming from a long way away. The voice said, Beth, Beth, is that you? She was confident it was her dad's voice. But the more she called to him, the more distant the voice seemed to get until it just faded away completely. Category 3. Answer cases. In these calls, the person making the call rings someone, has a conversation, and only later finds out that the person they were speaking to is actually dead. Crystal S. rang her friend Jessica's cousin Amelia's number. 
An old lady answered, claiming to be Amelia's grandmother, saying, No, dear, Amelia isn't here, sweetie. I should be expecting her any minute now. So, Crystal says, I thought nothing of it and hung up. When Crystal asked Jessica, she said, Amelia's grandma's dead, and we were there all day long. We were sitting right there by the phone. It never rang all day. Mary B. says that she made a sales call to Pennsylvania and spoke to a woman who identified herself as Mrs. B. The sales call seemed reasonable, but she wouldn't agree to the sale until she talked to her husband. The next day, Mary phoned back to speak to the husband, who was astounded. He told Mary that his wife had passed away some time previously. In 1969, a New Jersey musician named Carl Uphoff claimed that he was called by his grandmother, who had died two days earlier. Carl says one night in 1969, he lifted the phone to hear his deceased grandmother's voice. When he questioned her how she could ring him when she was dead, she ended the call. Over the next several days, there were several similar calls, and each time Carl asked her where she was or how she could call, the line went dead. The calls kept happening for nearly a week until one day they mysteriously stopped. Author Susie Smith in her 1975 book The Power of the Mind recounted how Bonnie and C.E. McConnell got a call out of the blue one Saturday evening from a friend they hadn't seen for a while, Enid Jolson. Enid told them she was now living in a nursing home nearby. Bonnie McConnell said she would visit her and take a bottle of brandy for her birthday, but Enid replied... I won't need it now. Several days later, when Bonnie phoned the nursing home, they said that Enid had died on Saturday morning, just hours before she called them. In another case dating from 1969, a young man called Carl rented a cottage by the coast for his vacation. There was an old-fashioned early telephone in the place, and to his amazement, it began to ring at 11.13 p.m., he tried to ignore the ringing, but eventually, in frustration, he answered and heard his father saying, Ah, there you are, Carl. Your mother will be trying to reach you. Call her up. She has a message for you. Carl offered to speak to her there and then, but his father explained that he couldn't pass the call on to Carl's mother as he wasn't with her. Carl then asked where his dad was calling from. His dad said, It's a very beautiful place. Be sure to call your mother. Goodbye, Carl. The next day, Carl found out that the antique phone in his room didn't work, had never worked, was bought as a decoration and wasn't even connected. When Carl finally got hold of his mother, she said that she had been desperately trying to get hold of him to tell him that his father died of a heart attack at precisely 11.13 the previous night. George Nuri, the radio host, also told about the case of Wilma, who said that her mother was dying in hospital after a long illness and the phone rang just before 3 a.m. Once again, there was lots of static on the line. There was a voice, but it was garbled, so no message was given. But later, the hospital confirmed that was the exact time Wilma's mother passed away, and Wilma took it as a farewell call. Conclusion I'll finish with an example of my own. Though not on the telephone, it did strike me at the time as a call from beyond the grave. In 1979, when I was 18, I had been to a party. It was raining hard and I wanted to stay in the house where the party was. I was, in fact, the last to leave. It was a three-mile walk to where I lived and, as I said, it was a foul night with the rain bucketing down. The girl who held the party said I couldn't stay despite the weather because her parents would kill her if they found out. They were, of course, out of town. So I walked off, aiming for home. There was a split in the ways after about a mile and a half. The quicker way was down a deserted railway line, but it was dark and lonely and there was no lights. There were always rumours that crazy people or murderers or something worse lurked along its shadowed track. The longer way was through a lit housing area. If I'd been with friends, I would have gone the shorter way, down the railway line. But as I was alone and no one would find out that I'd chickened out, I walked the long way through the houses. But... There was something made me hesitate. And as I stood there deliberating, I had the strong sense of a voice which I took to be my late grandfather, a man who'd always looked out for me. This voice, though impression would be closer to the mark because I didn't actually hear the words, urged me very strongly 
to walk the darker way and avoid the shortcut. My rational brain told me that this was nonsense, and after a long period of hesitation, I walked off down the lit street and not down the railway line. At the end of this lit road, there was a shortcut over a small bridge. From there, I could climb quickly through a churchyard, but I wasn't afraid of the ghost, so that wouldn't be a problem. What was the problem was the torrential rain that had swollen the stream so it ran high over the single span of the bridge. I put my foot on the bridge and soaked my shoe, now realising the water was up over the concrete, but it was so dark I couldn't see exactly how deep it was. There was a handrail on one side of the bridge, and the small bridge was just a concrete span, about ten feet, maybe twelve feet, so I judged I'd be okay and get over safely. I waded out one hand to steady myself on the single handrail to my right. After about six paces, I knew I wasn't going to be fine. The current was rushing down the stream, and it took my legs from under me, and before I knew it, I was being sucked under the bridge. On top of that, I was wearing a substantial military great coat. They were all the rage back then where I lived. The coat was saturated and got heavy and worse still. Someone had put chicken wire on the underneath of the bridge on the seaward side to collect bits of wood and logs and stop them careering down the stream bed. If I went under there, I knew I'd get stuck in the wire and I would never come out the other side. I hung on to the concrete with my fingertips. It seemed a long time, but was probably only a minute. And then... And the Lord alone knows how I got the strength to fight that mighty current or what guardian angel was looking after me that night. I did find the strength and dragged myself back onto the bridge, pulled myself up and escaped my fate. So, I've never had a phone call from the dead, but I firmly believe that voice was my grandfather warning me. He warned me many times during his life not to do crazy things when I was a boy. He did so again on that rainy night. And once again... I ignored him, but luckily, he gave me a second chance. This is another story, a true story, from my ghost hunting days, and this actually happened to me. We used to go to a place called Chillingham Castle in Northumberland, which was reputedly the most haunted castle in England. Now, you've got to understand that many castles claim this, but I think in Chillingham's case, there was a lot of substance to the claim. It was riddled with ghosts. It was a really popular place for me to take a tour group to, and I have lots of stories, mainly from other people, but this happened to me. So at uh, this particular time we had a full group and the castle was actually full. So all the paying guests stayed in the castle itself. Now, a short walk away on the grounds was the old stable block where the, going back centuries, the servants would have lived there. The gardeners, the blacksmiths, millers, I don't know. Now, that to me was the most haunted place in the castle. This particular night, I was woken up in the middle of the night. Now, this castle is in the middle of rural Northumberland. There's no cities or roads for miles and miles and miles. The sky is black. There are no electric lights. There's a village, a tiny hamlet. It's a very remote place. So it was very dark and very quiet. 
except I could hear the sound of engines revving. Lots and lots of engines. It was very unmistakable what was going on. I was so convinced that outside were engines revving, I actually opened the curtains and peered out into the courtyard. And of course, there was nothing there. And then the engine noise faded. Now the next day, I tried to find some sense from the housekeeper about what had happened. And she said that during the Second World War, the castle had been taken over by the British Army and they used to have all their vehicles and of course in the morning they would set all the vehicles engines on just to make sure that they were all working and so in a funny way I think I was hearing either that routine or perhaps some mission they were all going on or they're all being shipped out to go to, to battle from their training and all the engines were on but it was a very distinct noise and I'm not actually psychic but that was a definite thing that happened now another thing that happened from that same stable block was I was in touch with another woman who'd stayed there because we used to book the castle on behalf and we'd get a, a little cut. And this woman had gone to stay there and she'd gone around the castle and even though it is very haunted and lots of people saw lots of things and felt lots of things, nothing had happened to her in the castle. And then she was in the stable block and there was a kitchen and she was making herself a cup of tea in a mug and she <laughs> had the kitchen door open was looking down the corridor and a woman who she describes as being translucent walked down the corridor and walked through the wall. She was so freaked out by this she threw the mug of coffee at the wall, breaking the mug, staining the wall with coffee. And you know this was again a very sensible woman, nothing else had happened to her like this. She had an interest in ghosts obviously or she wouldn't have been there but she had never had any experiences, she didn't claim to be psychic, she'd never seen a ghost before and here she is with this translucent woman. Was it true? I don't know for myself, but it certainly was a weird place, that stable block. Years ago, when I used to lead ghost tours around the UK and Ireland, we would have a group of people come and I'd show them around the castle, I would tell them the stories. Before we got the psychic involved, I would just let them talk about their experiences because a lot of people who came on these tours had stories to tell of their own. I remember there was a young woman from London who was in her mid-thirties and she came up with her fiancé, they were soon to be married. She told me about a recurring dream that she'd had. So in this dream, she was back at her primary school, her elementary school, so she would be about eight or nine. And she said that in this dream, there was some kind of monster that kept coming for them. And the atmosphere would change and things would go very creepy and scary. And she would become aware that this thing was coming into the room where all the kids were. And she said that the teachers were there but they didn't do anything. They just kind of looked on as if they were helpless to do anything at all. And this monster, or whatever it was, because she never clearly saw it, would come and take one of her classmates. Now, she said she had this year recurringly over, she was 35. 
So, you know, that's 20 plus years. And every time she had the dream, there were fewer and fewer of her classmates. And she knew that eventually she would be the one to be taken. And by the time she spoke to me, there were only two of them left in the dream. And she said that in the dream, each time the monster came, they were all older. So she said that the classmates grew older with her in the dream, but the teachers didn't. The teachers stayed the same age. Now, she was a rational person, and she kind of knew it was just a dream. And I'm not sure she'd researched the fate of those who had actually gone. Some, I think, uh, I remember her saying, had actually died. But, you know, that can happen over a period of, you know, 20 plus years. And she was scared that the next time but one that she had the dream, and because it was a random interval, she didn't know when that would be, that the monster would come and take her. That would be her gone. I don't know what happened. I never saw her again. This is another true story from my own ghost hunting days, and again, it happened to me. And you'll hear me say that I am not psychic, I am not, I've never seen a ghost. Members of my family have, but I've never seen a ghost. But this was a very strange experience that happened, and it was rare for these things to happen. I used to go and do hundreds of these tours, you know, over the years, and very rarely would anything happen. This one particular evening, we were in the library at Dalston Hall, and we used to have the candles on for atmosphere. And we were sitting there with a group of guests and we had these uh, electronic EMF meters and they were to detect electrical currents based on the theory that ghosts are associated with random uh, anomalous electrical disturbances. So sometimes we would find electrical readings in the middle of a room where there was no equipment, no power wires, no nothing. You know, it was hard to explain why that would be. This particular night, I had the strangest sensation that my hand wanted to write, okay? So I picked up a pen and it started to write. And it started to write in this strange copper plate hand that wasn't mine. Mine's a pretty scrawly, modern scribble. And it wrote out a number of messages. Now, over the period that I went there, I did this about two or three times afterwards. And this wrote out the name of George Dalston and I asked questions of nobody, nobody there anyway, and I got answers that this guy had lived in the castle and it was during the English Civil War. And, you no, know, bizarrely, this all panned out and turned out to be true. I don't remember knowing that before I researched it, but it was the weirdest feeling. And when I used the EMF meter on my hand, my hand had an electrical charge. Now, then later on, you can do this yourself if you happen to have an EMF meter, it doesn't, they don't carry electrical charges, not enough to, to set the meter off. But this particular time, and only when the automatic writing came through, my hand had an electrical charge. And George Dalson came, and he was one of the people that came to me uh, over a period of um, 
a few weeks when we were going back there. It was the strangest experience and you can ask me what I make of it and I honestly don't know. Is it something to do with my subconscious? Was it some kind of spirit that belonged to the place? I absolutely don't know. All I know is that it really happened. So this is a members only video and I had in fact sat down and recorded the whole of the first lengthy chapter, Christmas Eve, which is about 40 minutes of um, A Woman in Black by Susan Hill. But my microphone didn't work, so when I came back to it, it was just hissing my voice and my face, but hissing. So um, I haven't got time to do that now. We're actually going away for a week, so I just wanted to do something and I had hoped to do A Woman in Black. But wasn't wasn't to be so i thought i'd just throw in a sop uh, which is to read you the listeners by walter de la Mer. it's a poem and the many poems the listeners by walter de la Mer. is there anybody there said the traveler knocking on the moonlit door and his horse in the silence champed the grasses of the forest's ferny floor and the bird flew up out of the turret above the traveler's head and he smote upon the door again a second time. Is there anybody there? he said. But no one descended to the traveller. No head from the leaf-fringed sill leaned over and looked into his grey eyes where he stood perplexed and still. Leaned over, but only a host of phantom listeners that dwelt in the lone house then stood listening in the quiet of the moonlight to that voice from the world of men stood thronging the faint moonbeams on the dark stair that goes down to the empty hall, hearkening in an air stirred and shaken by the lonely traveller's call. And he felt in his heart their strangeness, their stillness answering his cry, while his horse moved, cropping the dark turf neath the starred and leafy sky, for he suddenly smote upon the door even louder and lifted his head. Tell them I came, and no one answered that I kept my word, he said. Never the least stir made the listeners, though every word he spake fell echoing through the shadowiness of the still house from the one man left awake. I, they heard his foot upon the stirrup and the sound of iron on stone and how the silence surged softly backward when the plunging hooves were gone. And that was it, just shot. But um, honestly, I would have liked to give me the woman in black, but we'll have to wait um, until I'm back off my barge trip, um, which is the first time I've ever been on a barge. And I'm, I hope I don't have any experiences like LTC rolled in the Bosworth Summit, in the Bosworth Summit Pound story. Okay, all right, bye. Night by Walter de la Mer. 
The sun descending in the west, the evening star does shine. The twilight deepens, the last faint spectral colours in the west vanish away. Now the day is over, night is drawing nigh, shadows of the evening steal across the sky. Now the darkness gathers, stars begin to peep, birds and beasts and flowers soon will be asleep. With that darkness, those stars and that sleep we are nowadays becoming less and less familiar, even if by good fortune we are neither city-bred nor city-pent, but live in the country. The tolling curfew, if it were still audible over some wide-watered shore, swinging slow with sullen roar, would, as heretofore, leave the world to darkness. But we ourselves, unless perhaps we are in love, or grief, or despair, or wish to meditate, hasten to switch on our electric bulbs. Paraffin lamps, even the Victorian gas jet, until it dismally hooded itself with a mantle, were a less abrupt alternative to the Victorian gloaming and to resort to candles even for a few hours is to realize what an aid their gentle light can be to quiet of mind and quiet talk, let alone the beauty thus conferred on quiet face and amusing eye. And summer or winter, candles are even a kind of company. Darkness itself nowadays is steadily narrowing in for most of us to being merely the domain of sleep, which blessedly has a darkness solely its own. We flood not only both living room and bedroom with a glare rather than with light, but also our cities, towns, high roads, and even our villages and lanes. Until the advent of the motor car, it is true, the magic, fantastic, theatrical, or serene of a country road skirting woodland or arched over with forest trees and illuminated by this vibrant glare was undiscovered. But a Guy Fawkes bonfire achieves a similar witchery and a less expensive spirit to the solitary wayfarer. As for London, one needs to be alone at night in the silent and deserted heart of the city to realize the overwhelming odds nowadays against those who plan some evil. I can recall no more bizarre solitude than that of the musty four-wheeler in which to the clop of its horse's shoes I traversed some years ago in the small hours an exotically illuminated Cheapside. And not another spectre, not so much as a vagrant cat, in sight. So complete, whatever the advantage may be, is our present slavery to the lamp, that for most of us it is something of an adventure to go upstairs in the dark, or to enjoy that curious fellowship with ourselves incident to undressing in it. To be naked in the dark is to be naked, myself and no other, but at any rate unashamed. To sit alone in it and to remain for the time being as far as possible at peace may bring not only refreshment to the spirit, but even be tinged with romance. Like Thomas Hood's roses and lily cups, our minds and our moods in differing degree are made of light or of darkness. They respond then, given the opportunity, to every change of light, 
A house in the small hours with electricity laid on is a fortress. Nimble sentries are instantly ready on its battlements. A wind-ridden or fog-bound house of many rooms is not. A tan sticker or stub of tallow to its name may seem, if there is still any childhood left in this, to be helplessly listening for the others, either from without or from within. But how else prove that there are others? A little experience will answer that question quite as well as any medium. It was to earthly night, the dumb hour clothed in black, that the three sons of Usher's well returned from the gates of paradise, and Sheridan Lefano, as every adept of the powers of the air must be, was as familiar with the dark as with his own hands. We dance attendance on daylight by instinct and confirmed habit. We should make an assignation with the night. For years I have intended to enjoy a spell of life which would familiarize me with the complete daily allowance of twenty-four hours in all their guises. Sunrise to sunrise, by merely shifting, say, half an hour forward, my habitual period of repose. Alas, like so many others, this charming project still remains a mere project. Our minds, Alice Maynell has said, our senses, our sensibilities, are profoundly affected by the hours of darkness, although as with the changes of the seasons, spring as opposed to autumn, as with the weather and our physical well-being, we may be only vaguely aware of it. The fancy, the fantasy, is then more sharply on the qui vive, restless, alert. Our chief and most active spy on actuality, the eye, is now on a precarious footing. The listener within may at any moment be compelled to supersede the sighted. Protracted night work, moreover, not only, it has been ascertained, affects the poise of the mind, but the action of the heart and the health, the door of the unconscious or of the conscious, edges open, stands less narrowly ajar and the solemn tide of darkness ebbing and flowing, the dusk of midsummer midnight, the small black hours of winter, is at least as mysterious as the tides of the seven seas. By preference or habit, we curtain out the dark, and unless illness compels it, we seldom have set intent to watch out its hours, and so taste to the full its solitude, strangeness, and emptiness. How strange at night to wake and watch while others sleep, till sight and hearing ache for objects that may keep the awful inner sense unroused lest it should mark the life that haunts the emptiness and horror of the dark. No close acquaintance with it is practicable by means of mere chance glimpses. We must set apart a certain hour and again and again keep quiet watch from open window from field or hill or garden, even if over only so brief a period as a lunar month. And of one thing we may be certain, the mistress we are wooing will not cheat us of our tryst. The world without appears to have been lulled into a tense reverie of attention, or to have withdrawn itself into its own private affairs. 
we begin to learn what weather means to the shepherd and the sailor, or heavy rain may be falling, its fragrant sigh overwhelming the silence under a dense canopy of cloud. There is a cold, sweet freshness in the late summer air, as if the mother of us all were giving suck to her Benjamin, sitting quietly in her chair. Or, the rain over, the leaden minute drops from leaf to leaf sharpen the quietude. Arrest the listener behind the ear. At night, too, the recurrent onset and lulling of the wind is less like a mere formless noise than the accents of a voice roaming through a world countless centuries before the spirit of man spurred its dust. Night by night, little by little, the stars and the planets creep up towards their zenith, as yet hidden constellations begin to thrust their horns above the horizon line, we realize how delicate are the degrees of dusk and darkness between the Stygian and even the starlit. And if we stay still, passive and receptive, the stars themselves begin to shake their colors in the sky as if they were endeavoring to transmit us an urgent message in some celestial Morse code of their own. Make friends with them. They will not fail us. Each gigantic tree wears a gravity and solemnity as of Keats's forest senators. Every flitting moth becomes a private visitor with an unspoken message. Every owl squeak is a half-secret countersign and every drift of open grass or road or meadow becomes at length as familiar as with the forest of Arden to Titania, to her lovely Indian boy and her elves. At the same time, we find ourselves straying into far less familiar regions than usual of the mind, an emanation far within the fathomless and boundless deep may awake, and not always to recall our griefs, our follies, our ruined loves, or our sins. A tedious, restless daybreak does that best. The imagination bestirs itself in the dark. The serpent sloughs its daily skin and perhaps because the night actually attracts less kindly phantom fauna than the day, evil and disaster are associated with darkness, dark thoughts, the darkened outlook, dark deeds, the night of the soul. The imaginative writers have given the sharpest edge to the word what is called Realism is usually a record of life at a low pitch and ebb, viewed in the sunless light of day, so often a drab waste of grey and white, and an east wind blowing. But imaginative evil, either in thought or act or art, is an evil that is rare, and may be almost past endurance. There is an evil dream in Dostoevsky. There are drawings of Goyas, and this, like the funguses, flourishes in the dark. By an act of grace, we have been given eyelids, silent, untiring twin sisters, which are not only an exquisite means of expression to those strange, lovely and eloquent, or strange and equally repellent marvels of life, light, color, and movement that gaze out from beneath them. They are also a priceless refuge and release from the distractions and fatigue of the world without. Sight indeed, unlike touch and smell, is not 
a local sensibility. It seems to flood one's whole being with the lustrous scene it bestows. Let there be light. And we ourselves are light. But since safety first, whatever its danger as maxim is a paramount instinct, we cannot at will, alas, except when the mind is so intent that not even a clap of thunder may win admittance refuse to hear. Nonetheless, how seldom in the waking day do we deliberately close a while our eyes, and thus regain for the time being the quiet and hospitable vestibule of the mind. This is because, perhaps, attention tends then to begin to waver, because the signpost in that peculiar small darkness fenced off more densely than was Robinson Crusoe's stockade from actuality points vaguely out to sleep. We seldom, even in reverie indeed, shut our eyes, since that way again lies night dream. The precarious authority and power of direction which we have over our faculties slips away, and we, presently after, become less responsible for what may chance to us, like Hansel and Gretel in the darkening wood. Nor indeed in our familiar England is night frequently synonymous with pitch darkness. When cloud is scattered and not dense, the light rained faintly down upon us from the infinitely remote stars resembles a lucent dust in the air. And surely, one of the happiest of our earthly accidents, there is the moon, the lovely moon des Anglois. Hi, this is Tony Walker. I would like to remind you that you can become a patron of the Classic Ghost Stories podcast. Patrons get access to the library of member-only stories, and I'm doing a new member-only story at least once per month at the moment. You'll also get the joy of supporting me in the work so I can continue to produce the regular podcast. You can become a patron by signing up at www.patreon.com forward slash Barkid, B-A-R-C-U-D. So if you did feel that you wanted to support my work, it would be great to have you on board at Patreon.